it surprises me like what what's popular and what's not popular because mm-hmm. i always think like this is going to be good and then you know somebody may think oh it's you know it's just okay or whatever and um you know it's just i don't know things kind of surprise me sometimes what people are into I've always like, because I'll get in like uh, YouTube rabbit holes where I just keep going and going and going, right? And you'll Mm -hmm. just find some random stuff. Um, And I'm wondering if maybe that's where like people kind of find us today currently. They're just like going through stuff and then eventually they just see this two two dudes and it's like, oh, sure, I'll I'll listen to that. I'll watch that. Like, (laughs) well, the thing is, too, is if they find us on YouTube, they're not even finding like us talking because what they see is the thumbnail. Mm -hmm. So they just see whatever thumbnail I create, you know, but I um, and the YouTube studio can see. Oh, thank you. (laughs) But the YouTube studio will show me, but like where people like found us, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so like, it'll be like, off of people giving advice in the military or like somebody's talking about some global event you know what i mean like oh the belarusian president said this and then like youtube suggested our video at the end or whatever and so it's like cool it's like hitting our target audience you know what i mean yeah. like, like that's where that's kind of like where we we want to be i suppose yeah so but anyway it's just kind of funny but welcome back everybody to the i came with fire podcast uh you know did a little you know, not a, not too much of a cold open, just kind of shotgunned it out here, man. So yeah. glad to have oh, Zach back though, for sure, dude, you have been gone the last couple episodes. I told everybody that you were, uh, you were getting some pay for play, you know, past <laughs> couple weekends and, uh, nah, but I don't know. Tell us where you've been, man. Uh, so I was down. So like most listeners probably know, and if you're a new listener, you will now know that I am, uh, I'm the fill in interim first sergeant for my old recruiting unit. And I've just been bombarded with TDYs, which stands for temporary duty. It's like a little trip mm. for people who don't know what TDY means. Um, they taught us. I remember in recruiter school, this is a little throwback oh, to far back. In recruiter school, they told us not to use acronyms at all when you're like talking with people because they don't know what it means, right? So when you're like trying to recruit people into the Air Force and you're like, yeah, so we're going to PCS you into the USAF and you're going to have a D-Rose and you're going to check your LES and you're going to get your CCAF and yeah, they had no idea what that means. Saying. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the, uh, they told us not to use acronyms, which is funny because now that I'm a first sergeant, I'm in like a first sergeant chat and they all use acronyms. So like I asked a question one time about something um, and they literally the response was like two actual words and the rest was all acronyms. And I had to respond back going, mm-hmm. I don't know what you just told me because I'm not like, this is my first time being a first sergeant. So can you break first that down? Lingo. Yeah. Can you break that down for me? Dude, yeah. It, well, it's even funnier because like, first off, you take it out, right? There's like acronyms in the military. And I'll, hold on. I'll just, well, I'm going to finish this thought because my <clears> brain moves at 5,000 miles an hour. And then I'm going to yeah. say something else. But there's like military wide acronyms that everybody kind of would understand. If you said TDY or PCS to somebody in the Marine Corps, they would know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, right. Yeah. But then you get down, there's even like there's branch wide, you know, acronyms or or lingo that if I said to somebody in the Marine Corps or the Navy, they may not know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And then even smaller, it's like communities in the Air Force, we have our own acronyms. You know, it's just like no wonder when you get out of the military, you try talking to people at your civilian workplace and they're like, this guy has like six brain cells, you know, <laughs> I've learned that a lot recently, you know, you're just like, yeah, you know, with this and the STLI and the uh, LES and I just was over here wondering what my, you know, it's just like, what, you know, you, I don't know, man, it's so weird, dude, the military yeah. is a, is a community that, yeah, it's so funky. But what I was going to say before is that technically TY is not an acronym. It's not. Well, I guess it's mm. nope. TDY. It's an initialism. Be... What's an initialism? It's an initialism. I don't even know what the hell it, that is. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna learn you right now, bro. I'm, I'm gonna really learn everybody learning. else listening probably because I learned this. Re- re- I got I my this not that I long. got my note. And... An acronym is is something that you abbreviate like a phrase right into yeah. letters, but you but you say it like a word. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, an initialism, uh, okay. right? You don't say titty, t- 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 I guess, t- or TDY, t- t- right? <laughs> no, titty, yeah, you say TDY, yeah, yeah. right? So that's an initialism. <clears throat> so acronyms are things that you pronounce as a word. Hmm. Initialisms are abbreviations that are not pronounced except through their letters. 
That makes more Boring sense because fun. I've always That's wondered because acronyms You're usually welcome. you just take like the first letter of every like word, right? And it turns yeah. it to its own thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like AFRIS yeah. is Air Force Air Force Recruiting Information System, right? And it's just the first letter okay. of every single word. But TDY, mm -hmm. where the hell, like acronym wise, if it's temporary yeah. duty, where the hell the Y come from? It'd just be a TD. It's touchdown. like they just cut out. They just yeah. They just <laughs> cut out the U and the the T. Yeah, you know what I mean from the word duty. Yeah, for some reason I don't know. Yeah, but PCS is like to permanent yeah. change of station. I guess station. it's still, on, mm -hmm. but it's not called a. Pss. So <laughs> no PCS. It's <laughs> like when somebody says, like for example, like U.S. Air Force Academy is anachronized into USAFA. Yeah. Right, so that you, you actually say, say it in the community, you say yeah. You don't say USAFA. You know what I mean? Same thing. You like, say USAFA. Uh, Pacific, like PACAF, Pacific Air Force. PACAF, yeah, would PAC be an acronym. Yeah, Pacific yeah. Air Force. Yep. Yeah. USAFE, right? United States <clears throat> Air Forces in Europe. USAFE. Makes right? sense. You don't say USAFE. Yeah, or yeah. USAFE. You don't say. You're that, definitely you know? right on like but the anyway. Com compartmentalized, like it gets like even more direct. Security forces is mm -hmm. the only like Air Force unit I'm pretty sure that uses the S for offices, like S one, S two, S three, S four. Yeah. So in recruiting, it doesn't exist. I've learned that in like in communications, like comm squadrons mm -hmm. or like maintenance squadrons, there's no S functions. So you can't be like, oh, hey, well, go to go to S one. They don't know what the hell that means. That must be a leftover from like being it's in the, pull the from army. army because yeah, yeah because I know I know for a fact everything. that they use it right. Yep, exactly. I was gonna say. So like, does the Marines. The Marines have S mm -hmm. functions for everything too. Hmm. So, I didn't know that. I don't. I've never really talked to somebody like you. Normally, like I don't know. I never ask anybody about their command staff. You know what I mean? So yeah. to like hear them say S S one or whatever. You know. Yeah. So oh, I was when I PCS two recruiting. And I was doing my in processing. Like someone there was like, "All right, head on down to like this office." And I was like, "What mm -hmm. is that?" And I, because I don't even remember what it was. Like, what is that? And they're like, yeah. "Oh, it's like, it's like where the um, mm -hmm. like where you're going to get all your equipment and stuff." And I was like, "Oh, S four, uh, S four." And, they, and mm -hmm. they were like, "What?" And I was like, "Huh?" And we just stared at each other because we both were saying the same thing, but we had no idea we were talking about the same thing. I was like, "Unless you're, I'm just going to go there." Bob Lazar. <laughs> Unless you're Bob Lazar, right? And then huh? S four means something totally different. S four could be where you're working on secret back engineered UFO technology. Could be. Could we're be. Like, yeah, we're like, and, and keeping with Bob Lazar, I feel like the whole part of that conversation like alienated half the people that would listen to us. Have no idea what the fuck we're talking about. Well, if <laughs> so, you're still here, it's okay. We're, thanks for being. Yeah, here. If you're still here, that's if you right. Left immediately, it's popcorn podcast again. Yeah. <laughs> if you Please left immediately, back. then you're you not going to hear, hear me insult you. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because you're not here. Whoa. That's right. Please come back. We miss you. Yeah. But yeah. It yeah. Is a popcorn popcorn podcast, podcast again. We're doing this. Yeah, yeah, man. It's a pretty busy, pretty busy month too with people that we have coming on. I'm pretty excited about it. We had to yeah. shuffle some stuff around, but but anyway, we're here, dude. Yeah. I think I you should really, kick us off. I will, but I forgot to tell people where I actually went. Why I wasn't here. Oh, you did. Yeah, Holy so crap. I went to a senior leadership seminar. It's where like all of recruiting from the DOD comes together, like not just the Air Force, and they powwow like trends and learn from each other and all that type of stuff. As a first sergeant, I did absolutely nothing there except just listen to briefings. So that was annoying. I did tell the general though, um, God, I can't remember his name. He's the new AFRS general. I told him mm, that. No uh, from a first sergeant perspective, because he asked me, I was the only E6 first sergeant. And he looked at me, he's like, "Oh, you're a brand new first sergeant. You're even E6. Oh, uh, what? What do you got to say to the group, whatever?" And I pretty much told him that uh, uh, recruiting's overworking all their people, and that they need to somehow figure out how to make production without overworking their people, because you're gonna lose more people in the end. And he was like, "Oh, Big like, he was like, duh, you know." And then he generaled his way out of it, and then didn't ask me any more questions because he knew I was coming in with the heat, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to yeah. fire me? <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, I don't even really hold this position. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> good luck, sir. Oh, you mean my temporary, my temporary position is over early? Okay. All right. You know, Can't even fun. find my position. You don't even know it exists. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I'm then filling I, uh, in, bro. 
And then I had to do a warm <clears throat> handoff. I got stories, man. We're, we're going to get to this popcorn podcast, I promise, listeners. But I got stories. I had to do a warm handoff Let's because hear. we had a so we had a rapper, and that is an acronym, recruiter assistance program member, who um, it is an acronym. Good was job. here uh, helping his recruiter, you know, put more people in the Air Force, or whatever. And on the weekend that he was here, he got super drunk, fought fought two dudes, beat them up. He won. So I guess congratulations. Um, But then when the cops showed up, he decided to tell the cops that they can't arrest him because he's a fed because he works for the Air Force (laughs) and then tried to fight the cops and got arrested. Wrong. (laughs) Yeah. So um, me as the first sergeant, that was like my first big thing I had to deal with. And I had to figure out like what prison he was in, what jail he was in, talk to him on the phone. He cried. And then I had to like give him advice. Oh, his no. mom, mom paid his bail. Um, and then I was in contact with Whoa. his previous, yeah, I was in contact with his previous unit, which was a training, his training unit back at Shepherd Air Force Base. Um, and then I had to mm-hmm. take him down there. So that was fun. But that's where I've been. I've been busy being a first sergeant and doing a job that has a lot of TDYs and traveling, way more than I thought it was. You had to take him to Texas. Yeah, to Shepherd. Warm handoff. Oh, you had to escort him to Texas? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Literally, I didn't realize that. Literally took him there, got off the plane, mm-hmm. handed him to the other first sergeant, turned around, got on my return flight, which was like 45 minutes after I landed. Holy crap. Yeah, Man. it was a whole day. Like six in the morning to like midnight. Well, <laughs> I guess when you, you know, do illegal shit in the, in the military, people treat you like a baby. Yeah, so I literally can't be trusted to get off the plane. Took my pocket out, inside out, and said, "Grab it," and we just he stuck with me <laughs> <laughs> where we went. Not literally. Got your Hoover <laughs> flag out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's where I've been, and I'm running the popcorn podcast. Okay, I'm gonna hit it off. Let's do it. Today, or technically Thursday, but the NFL is back. Brandon, it's been a long absence of no football Sundays. Yeah, I know. It's, it's very, glorious. very sad, um, but it's back. So mm. this is kind of a it's kind of a two parter, right? Okay. What is your favorite team? You kind of already know what mine is. What is your favorite team? Don't be shaking your head on my shirt. And then I'm shaking. And my head. then who is your prediction and why for the Super Bowl? We're gonna bring the it out Super right Bowl. now. I don't. You you can guess no, who's gonna win, but I want. Or not, mm-hmm. but I want to know who's who's going to make it there. Who's it going to be? Hmm. Okay, that's a complicated one, man. Because we're such beginning of the season. I know. <clears throat> Haven't seen a lot, but uh, favorite team <laughs> is the 49ers. So Boom. gotta do that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You know, you can wear this shirt here and try and you know make me feel bad as as a Seahawks fan over there. But we all know that you're wrong. Okay. So it's okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, there's a pretty pretty funny sound clip. I don't know if you saw it, but apparently uh, Gino, oh, Gino Smith got super, running from Aaron yeah, Donald. super <laughs> duper scared. He's scared. Yeah, he said, oh, my God. And uh, Aaron Donald came running yeah. at him, ready to we kill lost him. lost so, today, like 30 or 13, to the Rams. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's okay, but you know who won today against the, the Niners. Steelers? The yeah. Niners, yeah. You want to know how I know they won? Because Brock Purdy is my fantasy QB, and he's currently winning me this oh, week. So that's actually not a bad pick. And I have uh, Brandon Ayuk too. He got me Dude, thirty had, points in fantasy. I'm going to tell you right now, bro. I was about before you said that I was going to say this. I had Brandon Ayuk last year, the most consistent receiver I had on my entire squad. I fucking love Brandon Ayuk. That dude is awesome. So I was going to tell you, dude. I was going to say, I, first off, do you have Brandon Ayuk? No, I know you do. Secondly, get him if you didn't, right? But dude, <laughs> play that motherfucker. I'm gonna tell you right now, dude. Yeah. Like everybody sleeps on him. I don't get mm-hmm. it. And I think it's because he's surrounded by so much other talent, right? Devo Samuel and Kittle. You know, George Kittle, right? Yeah. And then you got like you know, Juwan Jennings there too. Right. Yeah, all these people, right? You know, McCaffrey's the running back, but like still, you know, it's just still like the ball. he does, but he does. He just gets like lost in that translation, but he gets so many first downs. Mm-hmm. He gets touchdowns all the time. He just for if you're a fantasy player and if, you know, Ayuk is maybe not on one of the teams in your uh in your league, which would be go alarming. Get him, which would be yeah. alarming. Go get him for real, man. Ayuk is awesome. But 
Anyway, uh, I saw, speaking of football, I saw Nick Bosa is now the new uh, highest paid defensive player ever. Another mm-hmm. player on the 49ers, which is which is wild how much money that dude is getting. Did you um, see that Joe like two, Burrow? 220, 220 million guaranteed. That's yeah. freaking crazy. Yeah. Joe Burrow, quarterback for the Bengals, is like the highest mm-hmm. paid player in NFL history. And they went like three and – was a three and – I can't remember the exact score, but the Bengals only put up three points today. Yeah, so, it's the Browns. But, yeah. Which is crazy because shout out to one of our uh, friends on the episodes is uh, Aaron is a Cleveland Browns fan. So I don't know how he lives being a, a Cleveland Browns Love? fan, but Aaron Love is a Cleveland Browns fan. Right. That's right, man. It's shout out Aaron Love. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's a good day today, right? The battle between the, the, the ghetto ass teams uh, in Ohio, just duking it out apparently. But the only time I think fan. of the Browns is when I took a dump and I send the Browns to the Super Bowl. When they go mm-hmm. down the toilet bowl, so I remember when the the uh, the Browns had the the whole Baker or not Baker? What's his name? Uh, am I thinking of something? Johnny Manziel? Browns had him. Was it the Browns? Yeah, it was yeah, the Browns. for sure. Yeah. yeah, my my brain started confusing Baker Mayfield and Johnny Manziel for a second. Same person, it's like both like the same clown, basically. <laughs> yeah. But <clears throat> yeah, dude, I remember how excited people were. That dude. Couldn't get his ass out of, out of trouble. No. There's like a whole Netflix special about him too, I think, now, right? Is there really? I think so. It's either on Netflix or something. There's some type of special where you can watch. And he like self-incriminates himself in several crimes mm-hmm. in that thing. And people were like, why isn't he arrested? Like, <laughs> Dude, I, I'm pretty sure I saw that they're finally doing like a special on the 2008 Florida Gators team. Because that is absolutely insane, man. First, dude. First off, yeah, you had Ur- Urban Meyer, <laughs> which we all know is an absolute turd, and then Tim Tebow, right? Which is just like the, the, the juxtaposition of these two people, right? You know, you got Tebowing, literally praying to God, you know, touchdown celebration, right? Yep. And then you got the freaking Pouncy Twins. You got um, what's his name? Uh, Aaron Hernandez. We all know about that. Mm-hmm. And then I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, but the other dude who's a receiver and just the most racist dude ever, white guy. I'm trying to remember his name. Um, but, yeah, it's just the stories from that team is, are mm-hmm. absolutely crazy, dude. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's a special out about them now, finally. But I don't know, man. Who Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Let's see. Who's going to go there at uh, least? Then tell me who go? wins. Yeah, dude, that's a tough question, man, because I haven't seen a lot. Like, I know – what teams are like supposed to be good. I feel like for sure the Niners are going to be in the playoffs. They played really good today. If they can keep that up and stay healthy, you know, I feel like that'll happen at least. But I just don't know, man. Obviously, the Cowboys fans, you guys out there, you think you're there every year. We don't boys. We, yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, dude, a little known fact about me was raised as a Cowboys fan. Uh. Changed my mind. Child um, abuse. It was, dude. I I recognized it even at the young age of seven. I was like, <laughs> I need to get out of this. It was a cult. But um, I don't know, man. I could see the Niners being there. I really could. Just the amount of people on the weapons on that team is is unreal. If they can stay healthy, um, and I feel like Brock Purdy, his gameplay ability. I'm just gonna say it. I feel like it's above what Jimmy Garoppolo brought to the table. And I think he's a better fit for Kyle Shanahan's office than Jimmy G anyway. Um but hmm. I don't so know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda say something a little little crazy here as a Seahawks okay. fan. Okay. I think the nine so my younger brothers, Cameron and Calvin, they're also mm-hmm. 49ers fans. And it's because okay. of our biological mom was a 49ers fan and they just and she just indoctrinated them, unfortunately, mm-hmm. even though we're okay. from the Seattle area, but whatever. So, um, like, they were literally born in, like, Redmond, Washington. Like, it's, like, 30 minutes from – whatever. Anyways. Just makes sense. <laughs> um, so, as a Seahawks fan, I'm going to say that the Niners currently own the NFC West. Mm-hmm. It is their division, right? Yeah, ours and, to lose for or, sure. Yeah, and I would say that you guys own the NFC mm-hmm. entirely. I don't the 49ers disagree. that played today did not look any different than the 49ers that were on their way to win the Super Bowl last year had Brock Purdy not got injured in that game. That if whole game Brock started Purdy, off bad. 
did not get hurt in that game, I think mm-hmm. you guys would have won and went all the way to the Super Bowl and won. You think we would have beat the Eagles? Yes. Hmm. Okay. I do. And I still think today, the, the 49ers that played today are just as dangerous and lethal as a 49ers the week before they got kicked out of the playoffs. Mm. Okay. So I would agree with you. The Niners will be in the Super Bowl. Now, who's their opponent? Dude, I, my, I might get called out for being crazy for this one, but like wild card, I could see being like Jacksonville. That'd be kind of wild. Mm-hmm. Um, for I just want to say too that Ant, that right at the end of the game, they played the Colts today. Anthony Richardson thought he's going to go like Vince Young, run it in, right, and just win the game, and got completely and totally <laughs> drilled on the two yard line. I didn't watch. It looked that like game. he, dude. It looked like he, yeah, he, that guy is concussed for sure, and then ended up getting thrown out of the game because of like probably concussion protocol. And then Wait, it was Gardner a Minshew, right? yeah, Gardner Minshew, I did yeah, see that. who used to be on the Jaguars, came oh. in, right? And everyone's like, oh, Minshew magic, blah, 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 right? And they lost. The Colts lost. You know, I thought it was kind of funny. But I don't know. That wild card, I could see, you know, Jacksonville definitely. I think they'll be in the playoffs. Um, I don't know. It, that's a good question, dude. I obviously, wanted, part of me wants to say the Bengals, even though they had a really rough game. Um, you know that I don't know. Who do you think? I think it's gonna be the Bills. The Bills I could see that too, yeah. man. So See, Josh Allen Bills, I was my QB last year. Yeah, the Bills have been getting so close. They've been close like the last like three, four years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it's just small little things that kind of knock them out. They'll lose by like a field goal, or they'll mm-hmm. like have something like wild happen, like their player just pass out in the middle of the field. But the uh, there's stuff there, like they have everything they need, and I think that they might finally have it all together. I don't know. They play tomorrow, right? They play against the Jets tomorrow, I think, Monday Night Football. Yeah, which yep. is going to be interesting because you Rogers. have Aaron Rodgers on the Jets, dude. Yep. I also have Aaron Rodgers in fantasy. He's my backup mm-hmm. QB. <laughs> I think it's funny because now the – what's his name? Sam Darnold is now our backup. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, part, of me, part of me kind of would have rather had Trey Lance, but I don't know. It was funny when I when I no one picked up Purdy at all in my league. I didn't grab a QB mm-hmm. until like round like six or seven. So I was grabbing Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, like I was mm-hmm. grabbing like crazy all stars, <laughs> right. and uh, DK Metcalf. Like, and mm-hmm. these people were just like, "Oh, we're just gonna not, you know, whatever." Patrick Mahomes went like in the first round. Like, are you kidding me? Typical. Like, come on, I grabbed Purdy like round six. And he's currently, mm-hmm. I think, like the third, third or fourth highest like point quarterback like this week. <laughs> Dude, I want to say two things about that, right? First off, when you started talking about your fantasy team, I just want to point out that you're a Seahawks fan, but you started off with pulling Niners, Niners players first. Yes. So okay. just want to say I can be right? a Seahawks <laughs> fan and know yeah. where talent is. Oh, okay. Got you. Got I'm you. not an asshole Secondly, like fan who just. I'm not a Cowboys fan. Dude, I'll just I just say dude, shit for no reason. <laughs> there was somebody in my league last year who picked only uh, Raiders players because they're and Raiders lost. fan. They did not do well. I just put it that <laughs> way. Yeah, but the other thing with it too is going to say is that's totally Brock Purdy in a nutshell. Anyway, that nobody picked him up because he was Mister Irrelevant last yeah. year. He was yeah. the last person drafted, and you picked him up. Dude, honestly, man, he's done really well. In my say, in my app, like tells you like how many have picked him up. It's just like ten percent rostered, so ten percent out of like thinking. millions hasn't even grabbed mm-hmm. him. And then, and then, uh, like pl- no one played him this week. It was like two percent or something. I'm one of the very few that played him. Dude, that's crazy because when you think about it, like I mean, first off, I think everybody probably was assuming he's coming off of a surgery. You know, this is first time and since last season, and that you know there might be some some dust to knock off. But dude, nope. I don't know, man. Dude's it ice seem cold. Like that guy, I I agree, dude. He looked pretty nice out there today. You know Cock what I mean? Purdy. But uh, but um, <laughs> yeah. But another thing too, man, you said uh, you talked about for a second. Let's just jump on it and uh, demonetize this episode real fast. But you were talking about uh, Demar Hamlin, man. I think that's yeah. so weird. Like, do you do you really think that he got hit like right at the 
exact right time to stop no. his heart? I don't either. No. There Did is. Just... I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say the word. Yeah, because don't say I don't want. Word. I don't want to be demonetized. But mm-hmm. <laughs> there is way too many like prime all star athletes who so LeBron James's kid too, right? Who yeah, who just within the last year or two start having a lot of heart problems, mm-hmm. and um, they're just like falling. Like that doesn't make yeah. sense to me. Like, well, dude, what? Do you remember what I sent you? I'm actually going to I'm gonna pull it up. Like, I understand. These, those numbers. I understand they're, yeah. like, all-star athletes who are probably pushing their heart and their body past, like, a normal human being. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the dude sitting on the couch who um, got the thing and, ever, and all that type of stuff, he's not going to have a big heart issue because his heart's, like, in REM sleep. You know, like, mm-hmm. it's not doing anything. Obviously, sure. the all-stars are going to have more of an issue. But it's very weird. Right. That like they're all having the same issue. That's what's right. strange. Well, you remember um, what I sent you that that um, that like letter, those whistleblowers that got sent to uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Mm-hmm. Remember what I'm talking about? That mm-hmm. I'm just gonna look at this. This is the number of the numbers reported right on on members in the DoD increase since all this happened. Right, other issues. Diseases of the nervous system, a 1,048% increase. Tachycardia, a 302% increase. Mm-hmm. Pulmonary embolisms, 468% increase. Female infertility, 472% increase. Like, there's an entire list. And <clears throat> for anybody who's listening, if you want, I'll send that to you. Um, what's, what's wild? It's is absolutely it, is it, nuts. Is it because of the thing they had to get? Or is know. it because of the thing we were all scared of? You know what I mean? Or is it Here's a combination one thing of the two? So I'll just like go off and say that, you know, correlation and causation don't always match up, right? Yeah. So something somebody that said, when I showed that to said to me, it could be too, true too, is that They're maybe people are just more. going to the, well, maybe people are just going to the doctor more. Because of everything, you know, and they think that happened. Oh, I need to go get my check myself checked out, right? And so, because you know how it is, man. And, and then for me, especially, you know, and I think it's just like a military thing in general. We don't go to the doctor, especially people that work like shifts like us, so so long, and especially if you have to like stay armed up or whatever. And you just go go to the doctor because you're you're afraid you're going to miss time off of work and how that's mm-hmm. going to look at work and all this stuff. So maybe just career. like it, maybe it it does yeah and, it, and and if you say it doesn't you're wrong it does um, maybe people are just kind of turning over a new leaf and actually going to the doctor more like I don't know that could be I mean and that logically right makes sense you know talking about what's the most logical and simple answer that one that's pretty simple but it could be the other thing too and I don't know but I, to me the biggest thing that that keeps that idea around is the secrecy and the way people try to get you to stop talking and about they just, it. They just keep trying to tactfully dismiss it. Like, just stop looking. Correct. Move on. Right. Like, exactly. No, I'm going to look Which, more now. Yeah, man. It's just like anything else. You walk by on the street and somebody's acting weird and they don't want you to pay attention to them. Like, it immediately just draws that attention. It's like that whole, like, don't be suspicious. Don't, don't be, be suspicious. suspicious. Don't, don't be suspicious. Be suspicious. Don't be... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're being suspicious. Yeah. It's like my toddler <laughs> trying to not let me see that he did something. You know what I mean? But he's like... Yeah, yeah side on and like doing one of these things <laughs> like like you're okay, looking what really it, weird what, yeah are those videos of those dogs that are like <laughs> i sh- i shit in your bed <laughs> you know what i mean did you do we this and they're this. like trying to like walk away <laughs> exactly right yeah but that's what it's like man it is and there's a, for people that are supposed to be professionals and then you learn all the money that's exchanging hands behind the scenes too as if that doesn't incentivize absolutely everything mm-hmm. you know so it's just it's just this whole mess like if you if you don't want us to think that way be honest open you know be real we're n- we're not all idiots Right. And it's just, you know, I feel like most people feel like they can d- discern between what's the truth and, you know, what's not, or at least recognize when something doesn't add up, you know, it's just, that's where, that's what keeps all that suspicion lingering is the unwillingness to be open and to acknowledge when things are not what they should be. So, but it's it true, but they're, uh, that transparency is never going to come because it goes against what yeah. they're trying to accomplish. So I agree. Yeah. But moving but on. Yeah. 
But moving on. <laughs> so this is not the droids you're looking for. It's not the droids we're looking for. So <laughs> Niners, I think Bills, and I think the Niners take it. It's not the Bills too. Yeah, I would I'm not gonna lie to you, that'd be amazing. And I think it's interesting too when you were talking about the Bills before and how they're always kind of like one away from that. Like one thing. The Niners too. Totally makes me well, sure. But it makes me think of the Bills in the 90s, you know, because you talk about like great quarterbacks. Jim Kelly has to be in the conversation, I feel like. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Another one that didn't win a Super Bowl, like Dan Marino, you know. But they were always so close. The Bills played in a couple of different Super Bowls and they never won. You know what I mean? There's wow. always something going Yeah, always something going on, you mm-hmm. know, that they didn't win. Jim Kelly never got that Super Bowl ring that everybody kind of thought he should have you know yep. he's definitely one of those quarterbacks you that gets brought up when you're like who's a great one but never won it and mm-hmm. him marino those guys are the ones that you talk about and uh dude and john elway was almost that guy too you know what i mean mm-hmm. and uh almost but um yeah it, maybe it's a bill's curse i don't know could be yeah could very well be i will yeah. say russell wilson his second year Dude, he was, looked a lot better today. I'll say this. I, I watched that game. He looked, no, he I looked better that today. Game. Yeah. But I, what I was getting at is that Russell Wilson, his second year with Seattle, he didn't turn mm. off the gas. He played just like he did his first year when they mm. made it to the playoffs and everything that year. And that second year, he went all the way and they won a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Brock Purdy, it's his second year. He's not got the foot off the gas. He's playing the same way. There's nothing different. Nothing's changed. Mm-hmm. They have the same team. Their defense is stout, probably still number one in the league. Defense win championships, especially if you have a QB who can work under pressure. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. Get ready. I, dude, I, <laughs> it's, that's what the announcers were saying today is that they've had the tools to do this for so long and just haven't, haven't had it happen. And you, to me, it's always been because of Jimmy G. Like, I've never been just a massive fan of his. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's probably people out there that are listening to like, oh, stats and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, a, you know, to me, the the casual observer, right, <laughs> anybody else who casually observes that team, it's just like, to me, he's always always the link, the, the weak link about why things never click the way they should be. One That's of them. Seattle's right? issue right now is Geno Smith. Yeah. He, yeah. He's okay. He's not an all-star QB. Yeah. Something's not jiving him with his receivers. It doesn't yeah. work. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't watch that loser team up north. So Okay, what's your question? <laughs> My question, dude. Okay. So, obviously, it's the burr months now, man. So, September, October, November, December. So, in honor of it being the burr months, I want to know what's something that has happened to you that perhaps you can't necessarily explain. But that could be supernatural and was scary. I want to know. In honor hmm. of the upcoming spook month. Something that's happened to me that was weird. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is going to be a throwback. Or not throwback. Throwback to me, I guess. When mm-hmm. I was stationed in, uh, in Japan, uh, stationed mm-hmm. on Kadena Air Base in Okinawa, um, there was a little time when I was living in the dorms that I could have swore like something else was in my room with me. Okay. Okay. And what I mean by that is I'd be like, like a feeling. Yeah. Like a sixth sense. Like, like, you know how like most animals can tell when something's staring at them. We can do the same Mm -hmm. thing. Like if you're like out in public and someone's just staring at you forever, eventually you'll like look at them. Like you can just tell. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was brushed one, one, one time was I was brushing my teeth and it literally felt like someone like grabbed my butt. Like full on, my butt was touched. <laughs> okay, Whoa. Whoa. and I like Sark. swiped it away and turned around. I thought maybe like because uh, at Kadena, the dorm I was in, you shared a uh, bathroom like living mm-hmm. area with, and then you had the yeah. two rooms. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Is my roommate here?" Nope, wasn't there. He's actually on shift the whole night. So why would they be grabbing your ass? Okay, this is a bigger question. This is. This is airmen in the Air Force in the dorms, right? They'd be doing some weird stuff. <laughs> Anyways, um, so that happened. I was like, that's really weird or whatever. Um, well, I worked with CGs, contract guards, um, mm-hmm. and they're Japanese and stuff. And I would tell – I had other stories, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. But I would tell uh, this one guy, uh, his name was Nagamine. I would tell him these stories, and he would be like, oh, you have a, you're like, you have a ghost. You have a spirit. 
it's like attached to you. It's not going to leave you alone. Like you have to get rid of it. I was like, well, how do I get rid of it? And he's like, you have to, you have to be gifted shishi lions, like the little shishi lions. One's like got one mouth open. One's got one mouth closed. Oh yeah. He said that those like repel bad spirits and attract good spirits. So the one with mouth open, like scares them away. The one with the mouth closed holds the good ones in or something. He said, you have to be gifted shishi lions, but no one can know why you need to be gifted them. So it has to happen naturally. Like someone has to mm. give you these, but no one can know why they have to give it to you. Like it has to be an actual gift that doesn't relate to anything with your problems. And I was like, okay, that doesn't help me. I can't like <laughs> trick someone to give me shishi lines or whatever. Right. And he was yeah. like, it's like that. He's like, that's what you got to do. Sorry. He's like, that's what you got to do. Um, uh, or you have to like go speak to like a shaman or something. It's like, I'm not going to go talk to a mm. shaman. They're going to like steal my soul or something. So I, uh, uh, just went on my days, just dealing with some weird stuff happening. Um, I remember one time I like half woke up and you're like in that petrified state or whatever, where you yeah. like can't move. And there's like a yep. shadow figure of like a woman. What? No. Yeah. Oh, there's a shadow figure of a woman who was like standing there staring at me. And I thought that was weird. Um, this all happened there. Well, I shit you not like. A month or so after I told Nagimine that I needed that he, in the stuff, and he told me I need shishi lions, I finished my shift and walked out to my car, and there was a box on my hood of my car. Okay, I worked nights, so it's like six in the morning, just got off, and I opened it up, and there was two shishi lions. Were they from Nagamine though? I asked him, and he says no. He swore hmm. up and down that he did not give me shishi lions. Okay. I've still to this day never learned who gave me the shishi lions. I'm it assuming your problem. it did. Put the shishi lions in my dorm. I've never had an issue with the ghost since. That's I cool. still have them. Yeah. I still have them. They're in our bedroom right now. Same shishi lions. Now, you, you, mm -hmm. the only thing I could think of is maybe Nagamine mentioned that, like, that'd be a good gift mm -hmm. for Zach or that'd be a good yeah, gift yeah. for Smith without mm -hmm. giving the context and then maybe mm -hmm. someone gave it to me but even That's if they, i was thinking if they did that wouldn't they just give it to me normally because i still don't know who it came from mm -hmm. that's where it's weird unless maybe i don't know there's other like cgs there was another cg there at the gate maybe that cg just did it or well maybe it transferred word of mouth through the to the cg guys i don't know but it worked well let me let me ask you this right because this is something that I learned when I lived in Japan as a kid, right? Mm -hmm. So I may need to be corrected. Um, the whole gift giving thing in Japan is totally different than it is in the United States. Like if I were to give you a gift, there would sort of be like this unspoken expectation that you would open the gift in front of me and you'd be like, oh, cool, oh, whatever. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, yeah, and you're like, thanks. And then, right, we'd have this whole like exchange. But in Japan, I give you a gift and it's considered disrespectful to open it up in front of in the public. person who gave you the gift, right? Yeah. So what if maybe he did do that? Or, or maybe Nagamini was like, you know what? I'm going to give these to Zach and then leave him wondering. So like that that sense of mystery doesn't really pull back the, the curtain on Oz too much about where you mm -hmm. got him. You know what I mean? Or how you got him. Yeah. But or he did say something to somebody and they were just like, I didn't want to give this to you, but I don't want to like go through this interaction maybe they knew that you know americans expect it differently than japanese do with gift giving and they thought that you just left them there that mm -hmm. you wouldn't have like they wouldn't have this whole operating you know exchange where you open them up or whatever you know because then maybe you would ask the question how, you know why did you get me these shishi lines and then mm -hmm. maybe they didn't want to have to lie to you and say oh well you know nagamine said you may may need these i don't know why and then it became that he gave you that gift because of Nagamine and then they would have lost their power because, you know, inadvertently he told him. So then it became about the ghost anyway. You know it's what I mean? Possible. Yeah, so it's, it's best that possible. it was left as a surprise. Yeah. I and think. I'm thankful for it. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty sure Nagamine passed away. He was old. He was like in his 60s yeah. or 70s. Pretty sure he's passed away since. So mm -hmm. I'll probably never, ever know where exactly they came from. But And you don't need they, to know. I don't. They work. I'm telling you they work. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Ever since I've had them, I've had pretty much good luck since. 
<laughs> like, it's been a pretty pretty good life since. So you know who probably needs Shishi Lions is the Seahawks. <laughs> good luck. You know what I mean? Yeah, they were for just, you. Uh, I'll just send them a box. <laughs> dude, dude, yeah, no, just, just go and leave them on the GM's car and don't say anything. You know what I mean? Just find like, what is this his house. Just put right. it like, on his, on his right. like, porch. Exactly, you go, sir. You probably couldn't even get to Pete's car- Pete Carroll's house. No. Or even probably uh, find it. It's probably gated. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's probably nice it's to not... build gates. I don't know. I don't even know where Pete Carroll lives. I feel like he's got enough money. He's probably got a couple houses. I mean, he's like I... USC's coach for so long, it wouldn't be unfeasible to yeah. think that maybe he's got like a beach house down here. I, I know some I know some players. Like when we had Jimmy Graham on our team, mm-hmm. uh, he didn't live in Seattle. He lived in like yeah. California and he would fly. He had his own private like – License. He would fly his own plane up to Seattle, and then like practice, huh. and then he'd fly himself to the games, which I thought was really weird. But because he wouldn't fly with the team, whatever. <laughs> I mean, didn't Jimmy Graham play at Miami? I don't know. Like the, the Hurricanes, like college. I'm I don't know sure where he played he at Miami. College. I'm not a big college fan. I usually don't know I'm, most of these I'm people. Fairly certain the he played played at the Hurricanes. Maybe he just doesn't like cold weather. Could be. You know, and it's like. A hell of a lot cheaper and a lot shorter of a flight to fly from SoCal than it is from Miami. True. Maybe. I don't know. I didn't pretty know that. True. That's pretty weird. The one thing I always found really weird is listening to other cultures talk about their like paranormal experiences and um, their paranormal traditions. Um, like when you talk about like the Japanese, the Shishi lines, mm-hmm. you know, growing up in the United States, we have a lot of different views on the supernatural and almost all of those views are have some sort of like root in western religious traditions right so you know you you think of spooky stuff one of the first things that comes to mind is the exorcist or exorcism right or demons or whatever yeah it's all related to like like christ and the church exactly exactly right you watch any of these movies it's always like you know invoking god to get rid of your problem you know what Mm -hmm. i mean but when you think about like, and, and you listen to like other cultures where they don't have God in the Christian sense, you know what I mean? What they do. And then they, obviously there's, there's the native American and their cultures here, mm-hmm. and what they do. And, you know, it's all of those are very similar, you know, to like energies and getting rid of them and having some sort of like, um, you know, I don't know if you'd call it like an idol, right? The Shishi lions, but like mm-hmm. some sort of statue to get rid of them. Like the whole, you know, idea behind scary masks and stuff like that yep. to like scare off the, you know, evil spirits or whatever you want to call them. That's why like, I every, like really cemetery in Japan has like Shishi lions on the entrance. Right. Yeah. And I just always found it really interesting because our, all of our stories are so like rooted in, in Western, like, like just like Christianity for the most part, you know what I yeah. mean? Like there's a couple of things that like I know about, um, that aren't Christian, right? You learn like divics, divic boxes, like those are those are Jewish. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like the concept of like the jinn, that's that's from um, Islam, right? You know, and then obviously that's where like genie comes from, and that's totally taken. Robin Williams is g- genie is not you know that same thing. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah, yeah. it's a lot it's a lot scarier. But I've always found it really interesting to listen to other cultures talk about those things because they work for them. You know, I remember talking to like my mom a long time ago about like how like feeling because I grew up and I have I have a lot of like creepy stories. You know what I mean? I always grew up um, with the thought process. I grew up in a Christian home, grew up with the thought process that ghosts were real. And it wasn't just like something I learned from a friend is like a family thing. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And and growing up asking like my mom, like, how do I get rid of something like scaring me or whatever? It always centered around like prayer. I was centered around like asking God to help you out or to intervene on your behalf. And I had friends who were Catholic and they asked, you know, the saints to intervene on their behalf or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm not Catholic. Right. But, um, you know, I do think that there is some sort of something to asking, you know, saints or whatever to intervene on your behalf for certain things. But, um, always was raised that like that's what you did to help you out you know Mm -hmm. and then when it occurred to me like at whatever point in my life that other cultures around the world that weren't christian right they have these same issues right with evil spirits or whatever and they handle and deal with them and they have things that work it's like why does that work in one sense 
and and the other you know what i mean like what is it and then it evokes that whole question of like is it this this just like some sort of like thing in your mind and this is what you're you're kind of fixing it with or or what you know because you don't and in Japan, you're not praying to God to intervene on your behalf. You're, yep. you're using shishi lines. You're using mm-hmm. two statues to scare them off and then keep good spirits there, you know? Or maybe you ask, you know, certain Asian cultures have, like, asking your ancestors to intercede on your behalf. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, like, it just makes me wonder, like, why and where that difference is. Because even, like, the earlier European um, cultures and religions before prior to, like, Christianity, they all have the same, you know, like, spirits. They would, you know, pray to whatever God or whatever, um, you know, to help them out, not necessarily the Christian God, but like a God, you know what I mean? I think it's the power of belief. Mm-hmm. I so don't like think, overall? Yeah. I don't think the end entity or mm-hmm. whatever it is that you believe is going to help you matters mm-hmm. at all. Okay. I think it's just the power of belief because there's, there's been a lot of like, it's just, it's just like your mental thought process towards it. Uh, you know, they always say like, oh, we can only use like 10% of our brain or whatever, or whatever it is today. And that might be disproven now or whatever. But I think that if you can just believe something enough, you can will it into existence in its own sense. Now, I'm not saying I could just sit here and think, oh, I'm going to summon a sword in my hand. It'll just pop up. Like, mm-hmm. that's not what I'm getting at. But I think like feelings, belief, and especially in a collective form, can actually mm-hmm. cause rifts or things to happen you, yeah, on different, uh, on like different scales. Yeah, you I can agree. manifest it in a way. Mm-hmm. So if, like for exorcisms, if y- it helped you that a priest came in and removed the demon from you, and that now the demon's gone and you don't feel it anymore, that worked for you. If me getting the shishi lions got rid of the ghost, and that worked for me. But it might not work for everyone. Because, like, again, I still think it's belief. If I got the shishi lions and decided or didn't believe that they worked, then they probably would do nothing and they would, nothing would come of it. If that makes sense. That makes sense. What you're saying that I would ask like kind of counter what you're saying um, and ask you this question. I have heard from, so I got the opportunity to meet and talk with an, an actual exorcist, like a Vatican certified exorcist one time. Mm-hmm. And I asked, you know, listened to like some of the stuff he was telling me and like, what's where I actually learned a lot about like hierarchy of angels and like how that plays in, uh, you know, in hell or whatever. And when they talk to demons, try to figure out like who they are, like during the rite of exorcism. Like, mm-hmm. and one of the things he told me that I found really interesting is that people that are Protestant will go to their Protestant, like religious official, right? Their pastor or whatever, whatever you are, your Baptist, your Methodist, whatever you are. And nine times out of 10, they'll defer to a Catholic priest because they have, you know, they're like the authority on exorcism, right? Obviously like the Vatican is what, and I know there's like Protestant versions of it and I'm not an expert out there. So if somebody's listening, like I would love to know more about that. Right. Yeah. But he said that, in his opinion, right? And you could take that opinion for what for what you will because he's a Catholic, so maybe he's biased or whatever. But that whatever it is about the Catholic right of exorcism is way more powerful than anything else. And this is this is like what he was saying. And that essentially it's because there is thousands and thousands like thousands of years behind the um the right of exorcism mm-hmm. and that belief. Um that that's where that strength comes from is rooted in those years and years of belief and, and showing that it works essentially. So it's kind of like what you're saying, but why would, why do you think maybe that certain spirits re- would react to um, a, a religious way of getting rid of them, whether it's like an actual exorcism from somebody's body or like removing something from a house or, or whatever. Like, why do you think, why would you think that, a religious thing will work more than like maybe like a Reiki healer or something like that coming in and doing something to like dismiss whatever's bothering somebody. I think it just falls back. Kind of what you just said is on belief. They have a mm-hmm. thousands of years of it working. So the mm-hmm. belief is that that will work. If I randomly tomorrow was like, well, not me. Cause I don't have enough following if Elon Musk tomorrow was like, Hey, uh, if you eat string cheese, you can't be possessed by demons. Obviously, no one's going to be like, what? That doesn't make any sense. But if he somehow manifested or built this like idea 
and this whole thing about string cheese cures you from demons and then it's like passed down generation to generation to generation and it's one time works and then starts to work some more i would mm -hmm. think that over thousands of years people be like oh you got a demon eat some string cheese the great holy priest elon musk created it back in 2020 something like you know <laughs> in the, it's the year 3500 hellscape that life has become right <laughs> eat string cheese and you'll be good but i think it's just the power of belief because the higher power if there is one right because not everyone who's listening might believe in one or anything but if there's a higher power and they they're all knowing um every they they, they have control over everything at all times i don't think they give a rat's ass what you do so long as you just have belief. Mm -hmm. So whatever you believe in and the belief you have is enough for it to work. Mm -hmm. So like in the paranormal community, much in like the scientific community, like physics, like the goal, right. In physics is to find like the unified field theory where there's like mm -hmm. the theory of everything. Right. Yeah. And you know, I'm not a physicist, but everyone, the collective thought process is that's never going to happen. Right. Who knows? But a lot of people try to do the same thing with the paranormal, right? You'll get like the people that are really, really into cryptids and they like love talking about Mothman and Bigfoot and all this stuff. And like the alien and cryptid community I've seen over the past several years is kind of start to blend to where it's that whole interdimensional Bigfoot theory thing where, you know, aliens maybe, right. And I've, are, are, are Bigfoots or whatever, mm -hmm. or vice versa. There's some sort of, you know, at play interdimensionality thing there. And then I've also seen a lot of, what it seems to be is a lot of Christians think that aliens are demons, right? And I don't know. I mean, there's it's kind of wonky. I think we've talked about it a little bit before. That book, um, we're hopefully going to have her on in November, mm -hmm. uh, talking about American Cosmic, talking about how those experiences of of saints back, you know, like medieval Europe, some of these people who were have became venerated as saints, the experiences they talked about having with spiritual beings passing on knowledge to them is very similar to the way that people in modernity talk about aliens coming to them and passing along knowledge or healing well, there, them or whatever. There and are so, Christian, you know, Christian sects on planet earth that do believe kind of like in an alien, like different planet type things like the Mormon religion. Mm -hmm. God did come from another planet. Like Jesus is from another planet. Like it's not a, like you would know about, more about that than I would for sure. Yeah, it's not a celestial plane. They're like from another like entity mm -hmm. in the universe, right? It's a physical thing that mm. if we had a we're gonna have a space travel, you and I could go to. Science tol Scientology, mm -hmm. as crazy as that one Scientology. is, Scientology as crazy as mm -hmm. that one is too. They also believe that like yep. there's like a an alien species that like brought them here and a bunch of other stuff. Like it's not the mm -hmm. uh, ancient pharaohs and like Egyptians or whatever. The fiery mm -hmm. chariots from the sky came and Anubis spoke to me. Like that could just be their like understanding of it at that time, but it could have been aliens, which would then be a demon or whatever. Just playing off what you're saying. Yeah. No, the, yeah, no, that I mean there's there's a that thought process, of course, too, like um talking about Ezekiel being carried up into heaven on the chariot of fire or whatever. For sure it was Ezekiel. Um, but I was more so talking about I feel like a lot of people think that the fact that there's like all this disclosure going on right now, talking about aliens, UFOs, whatever, that that's actually demonic and it's not it's the actually extraterrestrial from another planet. Right. Well, it's not the rapture because the rapture would be people leaving the planet, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Spiritually. But it's like the start um, of like the second coming of Christ is, and stuff like what, that. Right. That, you know, so, uh, which I just think I, I was going to say, right, is is so weird to me because I don't think that at all. And But whatever, I mean, to each <laughs> their own. But I, what I was going to say is that when I was like, going back to the whole like unified theory thing, that there's no unified theory in physics or whatever. You go and you let's say you have a specific issue on your property, your house, and you, you know, you describe your problem to somebody who is, um, you know, is a professional in the paranormal community right whatever that looks like professional mm -hmm. in the paranormal community and they could say to you well like what you're describing sounds like an issue with something that is an elemental right and they'll say 
nothing with religion is ever going to help you. You need some sort of shaman or something like that. And at the the most, that shaman is only going to be able to keep it away from you. It's never going to get rid of it completely. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or you have to figure out a way to like appease whatever it is so it leaves you alone. Because it's so old, it has nothing to do with religion, right? Yeah. In the sense that we know it. And kind of talking that out, it almost does kind of tie back into the whole belief thing. Because if it's, you know, let's say this elemental spirit, I guess, has been around for billions of years, then the belief system in something like Christianity or whatever is only a couple thousand years old, right? then of course it's not going to have any sort of authority over something that is that old, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That is kind of interesting. It's all about like what, what you believe. Cause I've listened to enough like paranormal podcasts and like read enough about people's stories and stuff like that to know that there's a suggested way to go about getting rid of whatever specifically is bothering you. You know what I yeah. mean? And it's not always get a priest by any means. And sometimes, True. you know, it's, it is some like, Native American thing or a Reiki healer or, you know, or I don't know. I always found that really interesting. Like why some things work when others seem to fail, you know, what, what they're lacking or whatever. It could even just be a play on what we witness in reality in general. Throwback to a previous episode right. that I missed, unfortunately, but with Dr. Hoffman, right. Talking about how mm -hmm. we kind of evolved to ignore certain things that keep us alive or whatever. With these spirits mm -hmm. and stuff, it's just the stuff we're ignoring. And yeah. there's just some of us who can just kind of like figure it out and can see it still or whatever because it hasn't been wiped out of humanity's evolution entirely. So it's just... Oh, that's that's what I totally think about why yeah. that is. I think yeah. that at some point, you know, all of our brains are, are different, right? But I 100% think that people that are more open to seeing that kind of thing, not even open, I don't need to use that word. People that can see that stuff there's just something in their brain that is still connected to that, to where they can yeah. still see that stuff that goes on in the, in the more spiritual realm side of stuff than people who don't. Yeah. And cause if you think about it, you find, I find it really interesting that a lot of those people that, that sit here and will say like that, that anything supernatural paranormal doesn't exist at all. Right. Those people tend to be, you know, more like into science. Mm -hmm. And like, there's a logical explanation for everything. And I also noticed too, like those people tend to be like really uptight about a lot of stuff yes. and they're very just focused on their lane. You know what I mean? But you talk to somebody who is, they can't think outside the box. super religious, obviously. Yeah. They, they, they have, um, you know, more of a like easygoing, they're not so like uptight about, you know, maybe not uptight about money, right? They're not mm -hmm. uptight about, you know, where they're going to go, how they're going to live, all that stuff. They tend to be like more open to and, and in tune with the spiritual side of things. So, I mean, as almost you can tell, like I kind of like, I know people who are very uptight in their life. They, they don't believe at all in mm -hmm. the supernatural and they think it's stupid to think that way. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, I'm not uptight by any means, you know what I mean? But I'm also not like, uber religious you know i think i'm just like very open to all sorts of thought processes but yeah uh, it's kind of like one of those things where it's like if you really don't think there's a spiritual side of things then to me that seems like the less intelligent way to think personally you know what i mean yeah because uh, even like talking to dr hoffman i asked him like straight up like do you believe in an afterlife and he said yes so then you know unfortunately it was like right near the end of our conversation and he had mm -hmm. to go but um I don't know. I, to me, it's just there's so many people out there that have stories about meeting something from that's paranormal, whether it's a spirit or they have these experiences. Like think about all these people now that's kind of become popular. Um, but to go do ayahuasca and have these experiences with um, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, right? Uh, and they talk about these like actual beings talking to them. You know, I don't think that that's just something that's generated in your brain. Quite yeah. frankly, because it's the same chemical that gets released when you in your brain when you die, you know, you could explain all those near death experiences people have where they talk about seeing beings, seeing the light, like all these things. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same sorts of people. And then um, I'm trying to remember who it was. I feel like it may have may have been from 
from like Brian from MP Paranormal. Uh, we had him on. He was talking about how when he did it that one time, he had that experience where he was in like a black room and there was something in the corner. And it basically told him, like, asked him, like, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here, basically. And you need yeah. to go back. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I do think that is like taking people. That's my personal belief is that it is taking people to a higher level of consciousness. Um, but I just have always found it really interesting that that what the other thought processes are from around the world, because we get so wrapped up in the the religious side of the paranormal here in the United States, mm -hmm. because we have such a heavy presence of like Christianity or, or Judaism, for example, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But I've definitely had some experiences myself that I can't explain, you know? And, um, you know, I, I would say like for me, the most significant one that I had was in, in England when I lived there um, as a teenager. Okay. And um, so we, right. So, we moved, I graduated from high school in Germany and asked my parents, I was like, Hey, you know, can I, I found out my dad has got orders to England. I was like, can I go with you guys? You know, I'll get a job or go to school. Right. Just for a year. Like to like take like a gap year. I'm like, dude, my, my family's moving to England. I don't want to miss out on this. Right. So mm -hmm. they're super cool about it. Let me move there. And uh, anyway, like the one thing my, my mom said, we lived in really small, like base housing in Germany was she wanted to live off base. And, um, so we spent like three freaking weeks driving around England trying to find a place to live. And uh, we ended up coming to this house and it was really big, like way bigger than a lot of the houses that we'd seen when uh, seen before. Mm -hmm. And um, we go in and ironically, you know, and, and this is one of those like weird things in hindsight is it was it was being rented out by two security forces members. Um, okay. <laughs> but we go we go into the house. Yeah. And they were moving on base because they were having another kid. And uh, we go into the house and we're like standing around. And we're talking to them, and um, you know, we we uh, we're standing in like the dining room. And I noticed in the corners of this big window that they had in the dining room were these two coins, and I recognized them as like St. Michael's coins. And um, I was like, huh, like I know what those are for. Like typically, like houses that have been blessed or like have they need some sort of like protection, they'll put those there. And so I wandered kind of like into the um, uh, the like laundry room mm -hmm. and there were more on the little window in the laundry room. So I just came back into the dining room and I asked the lady, I'm like, hey, what's up with the, the St. Michael's coins? And she was like, oh, uh, we actually just had the house blessed because, you know, we were having some weird stuff happening, you know, and um, everything's fine now, blah, 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 you know. And I remember thinking like, I, I want to say like, almost 19 years old. I looked at my mom and I was like, there's no way we're renting this house. Right. <laughs> like it just got like blessed to get rid of like the yeah. evil spirits in this house. Like it's like, sure enough, that ended theme. up being the house we rented. Yeah. It's like the common it theme is. and it like is. most and like was... scary movie things. The, the it white started family off exactly moves into the same. A, like, oh, this, this house was so cheap. It was like, why does no one want to live here? And it's like possessed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Bro, so we we ended up moving in like I don't know a couple of days later, and um so like I said I was out of high school like taking a gap year, so my two my two siblings were at school my dad was at work, and my mom and I were in the kitchen. This is the first morning we were there. We were unloading boxes, and sure enough, dude, we're standing there. We're not really talking, kind of like looking at what's in the boxes, and we hear footsteps going up the stairs, which is in like the front of the house, right? And where I like look at my mom and I'm like, is that, is that like, am I hearing what I think I'm hearing right now? And she yelled for my yeah, dad. You know, she said, she, no, <laughs> she said his name, right? No answer. So we both just kind of like wandered into the front of the house. And um, we stood at the bottom of the stairs in the foyer and whatever it was finished going up the stairs. And we heard these footsteps and it cut left down the hallway and then walked into my parents' room. And we knew it walked in my parents' room because right when you first walked in for like the first three feet, anywhere you stepped, you were going to like have this like really loud creaking noise. And, uh, you know, you knew you were going in there. Yeah. And it did that. Right. So my mom just like said like, okay, whatever you are in this house, like, you know, as long as you're nice, you can stay here, but otherwise you got to leave, blah, blah, blah. Right. And I saw him like, what the fuck? You know, I like, looked at my mom Demon's and I'm like, like See? stay it. I'm not See? nice. I gotta exactly. Go. Like, <laughs> we, we, we rented this house out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, after all this stuff. And uh, anyway, so 
one night I worked at, ended up getting a job, right? And I was working at the shop and on base. And um, I ended up coming back like super duper late one night. And um, I went, you know, went home. I used to bring my food home because my mom, like I told her, like, you know, you don't, you don't have to worry about bringing, like keeping dinner for me or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I went into our kitchen, I, like heated up my food. But one of the things I did before I went into the kitchen to heat up my food was I went into the living room and I turned the TV on. I didn't turn all the lights on because I didn't want to wake anybody up, but I turned the TV on because I was going to watch a movie while I ate my dinner. And um, when I came back, went back into the kitchen, came back out, and I was about to walk into the living room and I had like my food on a tray, right? And dude, out of the corner of my eyes, I walked out of the freaking uh dining room into the living room there was just this black mass like shadow Ugh. dude yes and it, i couldn't tell if like it was just like the light coming off of the tv that was causing this or mm-hmm. what so like it did like did like one of those things where like i stood there like frozen like looking at it right and it was like what the fuck you know and then Sizing realized that yes that's there and then mm-hmm. like walked out turned around set the tray on the table and just went upstairs right and went to bed <laughs> and in the morning my dad came into the freaking room and he woke me up because i left a full glass of milk and like one of those individual stouffer's lasagnas and like something else on a tray on the table <laughs> he's like what the hell is up with the food on the table for no freaking reason yeah, and like, like what the heck man exactly he's like dude you know how much a gallon of milk costs and um so i don't remember what the hell i told him but the whole year i lived there i had the craziest experiences always we hear footsteps but you know, like i said man the weirdest thing that ever happened to me in that house and i know all this shit is weird anyway mm-hmm. um i had so much sleep paralysis like you were talking about before yeah. and so the fir- I, I remember the first time I ever had sleep paralysis, it happened to me when I was in Germany and I was in high school. And it was like one of the few times it ever like went in the middle of the day to take a nap because I was just exhausted. You had and, sleep paralysis um, in the day? I did, dude. That's And so I went to sleep, took a nap. And my- so the funny thing is, too, is my I had a TV in my room with uh, our Super Nintendo and our Nintendo 64. Oh, yeah. And my brother and sister were in my room and they were playing games. And I told them they could while I took a nap. And uh, I woke up and I could still hear them and I was going to get up and like interact with them, but I couldn't. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? You know what I mean? Like, I can't move, but I can hear them talking. You know what I mean? And then I tried to talk. You know what I mean? And I couldn't talk. And the first thing that came to my mind was I'm now one of those people that's in a coma that can hear everything and can't say or move and i was like dude i i started like freaking out like mentally like my heart started racing all the shit yeah i got so scared dude i thought it was like trapped in my body my fears and dude well it's happened to me so many times since that i i don't i recognize what it is and can kind of calm down uh and like get out of it or go back to sleep but i and obviously ended up coming out of it and like was terrified and told my mom what the hell just happened and she's like i don't know that's really weird maybe you're dream date or whatever but i had it so much in that house in England, I've never had it more than when I lived there. Mm. And um, it's the first time I ever had it to the point where I was actually feeling something and hearing things while I was doing it or while it was happening to me. Right. One night, um, you know, I went to bed and I was, I was asleep and I got woken up with this like really, really loud crashing noise. And the first thing in my brain that I thought what it was, was somebody had kicked down our front door. And I need to tell you that when you, all the houses, the front doors in Europe, for the most part, don't have like actual doorknobs. They have like locks Mm -hmm. and you unlock the door and there's like a a spring and it kind of kicks the door open. Or if they have a door, it's just a handle. You don't turn it. Right. Mm -hmm. But in this house, it was like that. And then there was like a small mud room and then another door, which had a handle that you could just turn the knob and open the door. Right. So now that you guys know that. So Mm -hmm. I heard that and I thought somebody kicked the front door. And I went to get up because I could go out of my room and look over the banister and down into the foyer and see the door when I couldn't move. And I remember thinking, fuck, what a terrific time to have sleep paralysis when somebody just kicked the door in, right? And so I kind of laid there, (laughs) right? I kind of laid there and waited for like my dad to get up because I thought for sure, like, because it scared me awake, right? Mm -hmm. And I, he didn't get up and I started like, oh shit, was I really the only person that heard this? Because my room was on the same side of the house as his. And uh, then I heard another really loud crash, right? It sounded like the same thing, like a door got kicked in again. And I, I say that because I remember thinking, why would somebody kick open the door 
that led from the mud room into the rest of the house because you could just open the door. It didn't have a lock or anything, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so now I'm like super duper freaking out because like something's going on. I can't move. And right about the time that I start like freaking out that I don't hear anybody getting up in my house, I started hearing like radio static. Like if you turned it to like an AM station, that's out. And it was really loud. And it was only on this side of my head that was like near the door. And it's what it did. It sounded like somebody was had held up a, a radio next to my head. And I could hear what sounded like talking, but I couldn't tell what that talking was. Hmm. And then I started to feel like this weird like pressure in my chest and it felt like somebody was sitting on me. And dude, I was like freaking out, did not know what the hell was going on. And so I thought, oh, I can't move. So maybe I'll make a noise because like still in my head, I'm kind of thinking somebody's in my house, right? Because I couldn't even open my eyes. So I thought I'll just try and make a noise like really loud. Maybe that'll wake somebody up. And I ended up making this like really stupid noise like, you know, that just some weird noise oh, that wasn't door. actually a scream exact oh, <laughs> no, no. no but it, it wasn't like uh, you know what i mean <laughs> but it wasn't like really a scream but when yeah. i did that i came out of it and immediately like all that pressure i was feeling the radio static that all went away and it was just like dead silent nothing was going on like everything was fine it, you know my eyes had adjusted to the darkness from like being asleep to where I could see everything in my room, like the shadows mm-hmm. and with a little bit of light coming through the window. And I went out into the hallway. I looked over the banister. The doors were intact, right? Nobody's asleep or everybody's asleep. Nobody's awake. Hallelujah. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck just happened to me, dude? Yeah. Went back to my room, turned the light on, went to sleep with the light on the rest of the night. But that happened to me probably three or four other times where I had that experience of, um, it didn't always coincide with the loud, like crashing noise, but the radio static. Um, and I would always like, I started to get this, like this feeling that what was happening to me was being done to me by like a female, an older female spirit. Hmm. And I thought that was really weird, you know? And I told my mom and they do, we had everybody in that house had experiences. Um, you know, my brother and sister did my, my brother and sister saw like apparently like a full like apparition, uh, in the hallway one time. Was it a woman? But it was a woman. And the funny thing is, is from working at the shop bed, right? You see all these people coming in. If you don't know what a shop bed is, it's just like a gas station convenience store on base. And that lady came in, right? And I asked her, her name was April. I remember her name was April. I was like, can you, like, I will walk away from my cash register to give you 10 minutes of my time for you to tell me what happened with this house. Cause the house is fucking haunted. You know what I mean? Yeah. And she She's did. Like, yeah, I know. And so, <laughs> no, she did. She was like, I'm really sorry. She's like, you know, we had um, like a vicar come and like bless the house and like, you know, it stopped for us. And I guess it, you know, must have started up again with us moving in. And so I asked her, like, what started happening? Well, they had a kid who was like three, three and a half. And he was in the room that my brother was staying in when we were in this house. And um, she said that he started telling her that, uh, you know, an old woman was coming in and watching him sleep while he was um, you know, in his bedroom at night and that she would stand in the corner and that she was a scary woman, a scary woman. And she thought that he like was having nightmares because that's kind of like around the time when like night terrors will start happening for kids mm-hmm. that age. So she thought maybe that was what was happening. But then she started hearing footsteps and stuff like that upstairs mm-hmm. while she was downstairs and home alone in the house. And um, she said one day she went to go leave the house and um, she had like a bench next to the mudroom door. And that mudroom door was like stained glass. It was like stained like an amber color. So you can see through it. It didn't have like a picture. Mm -hmm. And she um, sat down on the bench to put her shoes on, stood up in front of the mudroom door to go and like open it up. And she said there was like the face of an old woman like pressed up like against the glass, like looking at her. And she said, it was just like staring at her. Like she knew where her eyes were going to be when she stood up. And she said, she freaked out and just opened the door real quick. And there was no one in the mudroom. And again, Mm -hmm. the front door, you have to have a key. It doesn't have a knob that you could turn. Like she left it unlocked by accident. Yeah. And there was no one there. And she said, that's when she knew something was like actually screwing with her kid. And um, so I told her all the shit that had happened to us by then. But yeah, man, that, 
that was like that's probably the spookiest environment I've ever been in was mm-hmm. that house. And my my family lived there for like four freaking years. I don't know how they did it, but yeah, that dude, it, whatever it was, man, like it it liked to screw with me for sure. And I think it's because I was always up super late coming home from work, and I was just like an easy target. But I don't know. That's crazy. Uh, this is completely off topic, but okay. the part where you said like your dad was mad that you had like a spoiled cup of milk and like your yeah. Stouffer's lasagna on the thing. So yeah. the, it was one day. Uh, so my parents got divorced and I lived like with my dad predominantly there at the end. I just decided not to go to my mom's anymore for reasons. And yeah. uh, so I lived with my dad full time. My other siblings would still go back and forth, but usually during mm-hmm. the week, it was just me and my dad at home. Uh, okay. I one time had my buddy Frankie come over and we had the idea to prank my dad. Our, our prank was we were going to take every container in the house, so like every cup, every bowl. If it could, oh, Jesus. if it could be filled with liquid, it was about to be filled with water. And right. so we took everything and filled it all with water and then put it all over the kitchen. So the kitchen mm-hmm. counters, the tables, the floor, everything was filled mm-hmm. with water. Right. Well, my dad yeah. usually would get home at like six. He didn't get home. He's like working real late. And then Frankie's parents came and picked him up and they left. And then it was like eight, nine, and I went to bed, right? Oh, shit. And there's still all these things full of water. My dad came, <laughs> home at like, dad came home at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock or something. And I know he came okay. home because all the lights are off. And he always park in the garage or outside the garage and then walk through the garage and then into the, the, <laughs> the kitchen. And he was uh-huh. walking in. And then I had, we had cups all on the floor. And I just hear, oh. <laughs> and then I hear, oh. I hear him just go, and he just went upstairs like he didn't come talk to me nothing he just went upstairs the next morning at like six in the morning he wakes me up and he goes zach i was like yeah dad he's like i need you to clean up all the water i don't know why you did that it wasn't funny (laughs) (laughs) that's pretty calm bro he just left for work and (laughs) i've I've talked to him I'd have got woken it. up ASAP. Yeah. I've talked to him about it before. And he said he had such a like long bad day. And then he's like he's like, he knew waking me up and me dealing with it then, but it kept him from sleeping, so he just went to bed. <laughs> oh shit. I was like Dang. Dang. And Did I you feel like I, an asshole? Yes. I still feel bad about <laughs> it today. <laughs> You're such that was a like, dick. 13, 14 years ago, and I still feel bad. I'll bring it up dick. to him sometimes, and every time I do, his face goes from like and they just, because like, oh. you know, it still like is a thing that irritates him. <laughs> Dude. So when, uh, I don't know what, when I was in high school, at some point we ended up getting a fart machine. One of those yeah. like remote, co- remote control fart machines. And, uh, we brought it with us when we went and visited all of my family in Florida. And, um, what, dude. I don't remember if it had like a double sided tape thing or like we ended up putting tape on it or whatever, but we stuck it underneath the dining room chair that my grandmother sat in every time for dinner, dude. And sure enough, we're like sitting there because it was like one of those things where like everybody had to sit at the dinner table to eat. <laughs> and my brother just hit the freaking thing, dude. And it, she, it farted and everybody looked at her, dude. And dude, immediately, like my grandfather knew that it was Sean and I, because we had done it. Like a couple times with each other dude she does not think that shit's funny <laughs> at all man like no one laughed like we thought we were gonna get everybody and even like later and like later i like said like oh like try to like joke about it in front of her she just like would remind us how disgusting children we were you know what i mean like that's so that's so bad you know that's it's just funny. not funny at all dude yeah we did we used that thing forever man those are like the best <laughs> gag things ever. i know I it's so the farm machines man zero I, harm it's a zero <laughs> harm joke I, for real dude we yeah. i remember for christmas one year we went to freaking salzburg and my parents were just like enamored with all the christmas stuff you know mm-hmm. and my brother and i were just walking around we found this like magazine stand so my brother went and stood in the magazine stand like pulling these magazines out that are like you know in a language he can't read and he's like pretending to read them and uh i'm just like sitting there hitting the button and he's just farting and all these austrians around him are like looking at him and shit he's just acting like it's not nothing's happening you know what i mean i don't know why i just we just thought that was the world's greatest time dude like this is so funny yeah Yeah, hours and hours of fun for years fart machines 
I like pranks anyway, man. That's like, yeah. my dad used to get me so good with pranks, bro. The, the, he used to do this thing, uh, like, uh, two stories with this, bro. Like when we lived in Japan, my sister was pretty young and she would go like shower. She's like old enough to like go like get cleaned up for bed on her own. Mm-hmm. And um, she would go upstairs and it was like, when you went up the stairs, all of the bedrooms were off like a main opening area in the hallway. And then like the bathroom was in the middle. Yeah. So she, because she was so little, would go turn on all the lights, like, <laughs> Her room, my brother's room, my room, my parents' room, and then go into the bathroom. So like all the light in the hall light, right? So oh, there was like no darkness. Yeah. And so my dad would like go upstairs and just turn all the lights off and hide, right? One time we uh me and my brother were downstairs with my mom. And I guess my dad had like snuck up at some point. We had no idea that he went up there. Yeah. And um all we hear is this ah, like <laughs> screaming. And then here comes my sister, like six years old, like running down the stairs and she hits like the bottom set of steps and jumps like 12 steps, bro, jumps and does this like tuck like a cannonball Mm -hmm. and hits the ground. It just like stayed in the fetal position. And my mom was like, what is going on? You know, and like worried that my sister and I watched her, dude, she just like leaped like like one of those like slalom skiers for a second and then like tucked and grabbed her knees and hit the ground. And I was like, what the fuck? I just imagine my like upstairs, like laughing his ass off, dude. Oh, dude, she did. She hit the ground like a sack of bricks, bro. Like, boom, just laid there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so but that was him. And he's just like laughing and my mom was pissed. But one time I, again, like he like knew when to get us. I came out of the shower. I didn't turn all the lights on, right? I go to walk in my room and I like did that thing where like reach around the corner to like turn the light on. You know what I mean? Before he, like, you walk into the room. Bro, he had his hand sitting over the top of the freaking light switch. So that when my hand went to the light switch, I just put my hand in his and he grabbed it. Dude, that was one of the scariest moments of my life. I didn't know what the fuck was going on, on, bro. Oh. Yeah, dude. Yeah, that scared the shit out of me, man. That was pretty genius. It'd be such a bad thing to do. Be like, oh, hi. It is. And then just walk out. (laughs) Well, no, he fucking, he grabbed me and like tried to like pretend like he was like pulling me into the room. Mm. Like, Mm. Just my brain went into full panic mode for a second because, like, normally, like, I could, like, my sixth sense after living with this man for years had, like, like developed to know that some shit's afoot. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, and, my dad uh, too. That di- dude didn't fucking go off at all. No alarm bells. Nope. I just thought my shit was over, dude. Like, you know, and because he would like he would we would be hiding in my room like i turn the light on and walk in and here he'd come like on all fours from behind my dresser like and bar- barking like a dog like at me and, like start swinging at him and shit you know and it takes your brain like 0.5 seconds to realize That's that it's not a, it's you. not a leopard you know or whatever the hell you think it is it just, just scared the shit out of me dude my yeah, dad got my mom go ahead my dad one time was uh, we had like the front porch. He he was underneath mm-hmm. the porch, like doing some work, or whatever. And I knew he was yeah. down there, right? Like I could yeah. hear him when using his tools. Like I knew he was down there. And I was walking out to like ask him something, and just my mm-hmm. brain's not used to someone being under the porch. So I literally like take like two yeah. steps, and then he just goes, gunk, just grabs my like my my ankles, right? And yeah, I should know it's my dad. Like he's under mm-hmm. the porch. He, I'm going there to talk to him. Grabs my ankles. Mm-hmm. I freak out. I try to jump, but he holds me down. I couldn't jump. And like, it literally was like all momentum to jump, but no jumping happened. And like, I, yeah, I was like, just like, like this. What was funny is I, it strained like my neck and like my back because I was trying so hard to leap and nothing happened. And then he let oh my go. God, dude. And for like a week, I was like, everything hurt. Because my whole body right. tried to leap and I couldn't leap. I was like, dude, God dang it. I think you went into full survival mode, dude. That's yeah. what that sounds like. All that adrenaline going in your body. I was like, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Nothing happened. Dude. My uh my brother used to like get really weirded out if like you would like hug him really tight or like if my dad like would like tackle you basically like like tickle the shit out of you when mm-hmm. you're little and still ticklish. You know, and being, my brother being like it, it like is a, is like you panicking. Like some people enjoy it, it is. or whatever, it's totally but it's panic. just pan. You're being pa- you're right. panicking. Yeah, exactly. It's your body's reaction to that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, but I don't know. It like made my brother develop this sense of like claustrophobia almost. Oh god! Because like 
if you got like on top of him, even now, like he doesn't like if you like run up on him with a blanket, like grab him really fast and like wrap, you know what I mean? Like try to like constrict his movements. Mm-hmm. He used to yell when he was little. He's going to hate me for saying this. So I'm probably going to clip this out and make it one of our things. But my brother Perfect. would yell tight motions, tight motions <laughs> like that. Like I don't what tight motions. This seems like opposing ideas to me for sort uh-huh. of like maybe it's like a formula one move, like tight motion. You know what I mean? I don't it's know. Not. But dude, he would freak the fuck. He, he would freak the fuck out. No, that's what I'm saying. It's like conflicting <laughs> ideas. He'd freak the fuck out and just sit there and yell tight motions, dude. And it's like this full on like rage and anger about it. And he he would get like hot and sweaty and shit. So like, that's how I knew like he was like actually panicking because he's mm-hmm. like, sweating it within like five seconds it was just like profuse sweat coming out of his fucking forehead and shit yep but uh dude my mom my mom hates hates this story but i'm gonna tell it anyway my dad got <laughs> her so freaking good before i was born uh they both had jobs right <clears throat> and um she worked at a bank and my dad sold cars and he got home he would normally get home after her but because he beat her home that day, he parked like up the street and walked to the house, fully intentioned on scaring the shit out of her. Okay, smart. And it, <laughs> dude, it is smart, Genius. right? This is. I'm just trying to like. I'm just trying to outline the calculus that goes into this man's brain to scare the shit out of My people. My dad does okay? the same crap. <laughs> Absolutely, dude, it's like total. Dude, when you become a dad, they really do. If everybody wondering. They pull you aside and tell you about this stuff. Somebody <laughs> does. But, dude, so he he parks up the street, goes into the house, okay? And he gets into the shower, like with a shower curtain closed, right? Knowing that the first <sighs> thing that my mom's going to do when she gets home from work is what? Go to take a leak, right? Mm-hmm. And get changed or whatever. Mm-hmm. Dude, so he waits for her. And, like, this is, like, 1985. So, like, she's got, like, the pantyhose on and, like, the skirt. She works at a bank. So she's all, like, dressed up and stuff. And, um, like, waits for her and sits down and to start going. And she's pregnant with me, mind you. So it would have mm-hmm. been 86, not 85. Mm-hmm. And uh, he rips the shower curtain open and just, like, ah! Like, you know, <laughs> she thinks she's alone in the house. And he said that all he saw was just, like, her naked rear end jumping out the freaking door. And, like, she started, like, low crawling towards the stairs, apparently, like, to get away. Like, she thought her life was over, apparently. But, dude, that's just just zero fucks, man. Fly that's, by that's, the freeze. And she dude, flew. yeah, no, she flew, bro. <laughs> yeah, that's ha- that's him, man. That's why I love scaring the crap out of people now, dude. <clears throat> I've got all these videos of me scaring like people that I used to work with because I think it's yeah. hilarious and it's totally just deranged and demented. It's because of him, and I, I'm kind of glad because I get a good laugh every once in a while from scaring That's the shit awesome. out of people. It is. Shout out, shout out to my dad. I got two stories about my dad. So my my dad's like my best friend. Like mm-hmm. he's so cool. It, I, I love hanging out with him still to this day. Uh, these two these two stories. Um, so he had access in high school. He could like log in and like see my grades. And you can see like day to day, week to week, like the teachers would update like assignments for the day, right? My parents so, would have probably paid money to be able to do that with my grades. <laughs> so he seriously, he would, he would log in. Now my dad wasn't asking for like four point a student, like that type mm-hmm. of stuff. He just wanted like yeah. getting the B's or higher, please, right? I don't care if right. it's a B minus, just being the B's or higher, you know, put some type sure. of effort into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so his thing was. If I got a C plus or lower and there wasn't like a good explanation, then mm-hmm. um, I'd be grounded from like my TV, my Xbox, a whole bunch of other stuff. Same. Right? Same. But my dad also told me that anything I purchased myself was mine to own and he wouldn't mm. take that that authority or that right away from me. So if I had worked and like bought like a, like a, like a cell phone, right? That's my cell phone. He can't take it away from me because he wasn't going to interfere with me being like an individual with me earning something, right? So you had more rights than I did growing up for sure. Okay, but my dad's not an idiot, right? So I'm going to this, I'm gonna get to this story. <laughs> my parents are idiots. Okay. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Sorry, mom and dad. <laughs> so we get to uh, – so my junior summer, so I'm about to go to my senior year, right? Yeah. I decide – you know what? I'm tired of my dad always taking away my TV, my Xbox, my all that type of stuff. So I'm gonna I'm just work. Gonna buy a house. <laughs> no, yeah. No, I'm gonna work all summer to mm-hmm. buy all these things because he can't take it away from me. So that's what I did. Mm-hmm. I worked my butt off. Also, and it's one of my fa- mo- most fondest summers ever. But I worked my butt off uh, 
all day, like almost every single day, just working for like odd jobs, cash jobs, mowing lawns, like not an actual job job, just doing weird shit all throughout the town as much as I could do to get money, right? And mm-hmm. then that summer I made like a thousand bucks. And for a nice. like a seventeen year old kid, sixteen year old kid, three months, mm-hmm. I was like, dude, I got the money. Yeah. So yeah. I bought my own TV, bought my own Xbox three sixty, the new slim model even. I had my controller, paid for my own Xbox Live, bought Halo Reach, Call mm-hmm. of Duty. Like, I was set. I was like, can't take it away from me. So we get like a month and a half, two months into the school year. My dad comes into the room. He goes, Zach, you should get off the TV, you know, get off the Xbox. Your grades are slack and blah, blah. And I was like, actually, Dad, you told <laughs> me. Yeah, I'm thinking mm-hmm. I'm winning here. Actually, mm-hmm. Dad, you told me that anything I buy, you want to take away from me. He's like, you're right. I did say that. And he left. And I'm thinking, got him. Hook, line, singer. <laughs> Power my room. I, say, I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> Circuit breaker. Yes. Yeah. And I'm mm-hmm. like, what the hell? Because the light literally outside my room's on. So I'm like, yeah. how do I, what the? I stand up and I'm walking out. My dad's already back, like on the couch, like watching like Dave Chappelle or something. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, dad, my power's not working in my, my room. He's like, oh, that's weird. I could take a look at it tomorrow. And I was like, could you look at it now? I'm trying to play Halo. He's like, well, since I pay the power, I'm not too worried about it. And then he just continued to watch TV. And that's when it clicked. I was like, I thought you were slick, bro. Yeah, I thought I was slick. No. And the power was off in my room uh, for like a month straight. Like that whole month, I had no power in my room. That's awesome. Yeah. Dude, these are <laughs> lessons. <laughs> these are lessons. It was great. Um, but no, he's a he's just so freaking awesome. He you were talking about uh how your sister turned on all the lights. It reminded mm-hmm. me about my dad. So even up until I moved out, like until mm-hmm. I joined the Air Force, he would still come tuck us in, right? Yeah. And so he would oh, shit. yeah, he would come into the room and be like, Good night, Zach. And as we got older, tucking in was less like I love you and more like <clears throat> you know, like more right, right, stuff. Right. right. So he, he'd come in. And he would like super wrap you up in like the comforter, like throw you on the bed, give you a couple elbows, maybe a couple quick jabs or whatever. You know, Love you. Right. But then he would go to the go to turn off the light, and uh, your eyes can't adjust quick enough, right? So he would turn off the light, you can't see anything, and he would turn on the light, and he'd have a different facial expression. Then he would turn off the light, can't see anything. Turn on the light, different facial expression. Turn off the light. And he would do that several times. So he'd be like. You know, like all these weird <laughs> stuff. And you'd be looking at him and you'd be like, it's so stupid. But it was so much fun. It's one of my fondest memories. I love that, man. That's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was great. Your question, bro. All righty. Let's get off of uh, good memories. Let's get to Ooh. bad ones, kind of. Um, oh, man. Sorry. Um. So America, right? Um. We had like a huge push to like fix our like um, energy into or, or energy infrastructure all type of stuff like mm-hmm. 40, 50 years ago. Um, okay. Probably more than that now. I'm probably like way underestimating the time frame. But we mm-hmm. haven't had like a lot of push towards that in like recent time, like power grids, water mm-hmm. lines, like huge critical infrastructure stuff are still like old. They're rotting. They're like, not new, all type of stuff, right? So I was curious if you think America today or anytime soon will actually probably revamp their whole like energy independence and our mm-hmm. own like uh, all our systems and stuff. Or do you think we're potentially too worried about outside things that we're probably just never going to look in and fix things? So I'll say that there's like this, I feel like it's a faux renewed focus on energy independence. And I think it has more to do with pushing everything toward electric for like the whole like globalist goal thing, right? Mm -hmm. We could have a whole conversation about that. Because I even just like today, like watching football, I saw a commercial and it was like one of these like California initiative commercials. If you live in California, you kind of know what I'm talking about. And it was basically saying how that is how the United States was going to get toward energy independence was going like totally electric. 
right? And it just makes me laugh. And like my, you know, my wife immediately like kind of said what I was thinking. She's like, <laughs> how many times this summer did we have to turn our power or did our power get turned off? Or like we have like the Google smart home stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They turned our air conditioner off or set it to a higher setting, right? Not off, but turn it to a higher setting to kind of offload some of the stress on the, the system, right? So the yeah. grid. Mm -hmm. If the goal is in five years to have everything be electric, electric, uh, you know, appliances, so electric stoves, electric cars, all this other stuff be purely, totally electric. How on earth are you ever going to get to that point without a totally revamped electric grid? You're going to have all these cars in the state of California alone, right? They need to charge. So what are you going to tell us? That on even and odd days, right? Yeah. You, you can drive on odd number days because your house ends in an odd number and you can drive on even number days because your house, right? So <clears throat> I Talk don't think that's a freedom. Well, it is. Yeah. Um, so to me, like, do I think we're looking at that? Yeah, but I don't think it's a, it's being looked at by at least those people in like a sense that like the United States needs to be energy independent. And it's just like good business to be energy independent anyway, right? Um, there's a lot of other ways that we could do it. And we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot over and over and over again about it. Um, and just like shout out to um, one of our future guests here in a couple of weeks, Kaylee Cunningham, Miss Nuclear Energy. Um, we'll come on and talk about why nuclear energy is a great way to mm -hmm. uh, be energy independent. People are so um, scared of it. And I understand the fears, <clears throat> but like, definitely, it's probably well, one of the most like looked over and controlled way of making mm -hmm. energy and it produces mm -hmm. so much energy for the for amount sure. of stuff and you put into it it's honestly one of the reasons why since we started this podcast i've like been on the hunt for somebody to come on and talk about it and was so glad mm -hmm. when i came across her stuff um so if you haven't if you're not familiar with Kay <clears throat> kaylee honeyham miss nuclear energy is what she goes by online go find her she's on tiktok she's on instagram um super awesome information she puts out there but i think that we will and are more getting to have that conversation about being energy independent, I think it's necessary. Um, I'm not opposed to, you know, um, earth minerals to make that happen, right? And what we have, I'm not opposed to fossil fuels to be energy independent. We have a lot of that in our country. Um, and that's not going to be the popular thing to say, obviously, because, you know, the whole climate change thing, and you can have, we can all have a conversation about that, right? And about, you know, what's real and what's inflated about it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would love to get somebody like uh, Michael Schellenberger to come on and like talk about it because he is a pretty good advocate, you know, against like being a, or advocate for being objective about it. But um, anyway, I think that we need to, for sure. I think we need to stop relying um, on completely on other countries um, and other ways and means that don't make a lot of sense for energy independence. Um, you know, there's just, I am concerned, like you said, about not focusing enough on it and being too focused on like global affairs to fix the issues. It's not just the like, electric grids in our country that need to be updated and fixed. And these are massive, massive vulnerabilities for any sort of like cyber attack for our country. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't take a lot to, to, find a vulnerability and get in and turn off the power grid and make it you know possible to turn it back on or what that just happened a couple of years ago where they shut off a part of that um that pipeline up in the northeast part of the United States and they held it for ransom until it you know was taken care of to turn it back on and those sorts of cyber terrorist kind of thing is another another layer of of warfare that is going to have to be um, outlined and defined as what is an act of war. Because yep. you're talking about turning off the entire grid to the state of California and what that does to millions of people in the state of California or Texas or something like that, where there's these massive economic infrastructures that uphold the United States. Is that an act of war because of what you're doing to people and their livelihoods and what you're doing to people and the way they take care of their families? You know, you're ruining food, you're ruining the way people get to work, all this stuff, you know, 
and um, you're causing mass chaos. Like, is that an act of war? To me, that sounds like an act of war. So somebody's going to have to outline what that means and then mm -hmm. draw a line in the sand and say, if you do this, and then what what an in-kind response would be. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, I think that I think if I think there's enough people now that are focused on that to where it's going to gain some momentum. I don't care what side it comes from. Right. Although one side more than the other seems to be trying to push everybody at electric, which I don't necessarily think is the answer. And I think that there's a larger agenda at foot behind that. Like I said before, um, it's also not I'll a good idea this. to put all your chips mm -hmm. into one thing. If we no, make for the sure. whole thing electric, you can't have a point, single point of failure. Yeah, then it, that could just all go away in an instant. Oh, for sure. Um, and you, you would you absolutely would need to have something to fall back on. I mean, just just like anything else, you know, you have if you're in charge of security systems, you need to have some sort of you know uninterrupted power system and then a backup system for when that if something goes off. Like that's just standard. You know what yep. I mean? Um, so you need would need to have that for people in your communities. But I want to say this too, and this has come up a lot with um, the fires that have happened in Maui, and they talk about making these smart cities so you don't have to leave, right? Um, and the whole process, the whole thought process behind this is you have everything you need within a 15 minute radius. So you never have to leave your town in theory, right? Where you could go to work, you could shop, your kids go to school. There's enough recreational amenities inside your town to where you don't need to travel outside to go to those places, trying to essentially um, discourage people from traveling and then like, you know, using energy and creating like emissions and all this stuff. And the, the town I live in here in California is one of those towns that has a plan in the next five years to become one of those towns, right? And, um, and obviously I'm not going to say like which one it is, uh, but that's something that the, the like city management, you know, here talks about and pushes out updates about regularly. And, you know, when you, on the surface, you look at it and you think that's actually pretty convenient, right? Because it's kind of like a city, right? I've talked to plenty of people that, you know, live and work in like New York City or Chicago or whatever, and they don't own cars, right? Because yeah. they don't need one because they don't live that far from work or they can take a bus or the train Everything's or whatever. within 10 minutes, yeah. And, you know, right. And that, and that is super convenient and I get why, you know what I mean? But I think that happening because of cities, you know, and then like when communities first formed and you know, you have towns, each town had its own market, each town had, you know, its butcher, its, you know, its blacksmith, all these things that you needed in that town. And eventually like people started creating, you know, other towns that didn't have that stuff. So they outsourced it and all this stuff. And, you know, however, you know, we'll talk about economics and, and people, right. On the surface, it seems convenient, but I think now it's grown into something else. Right. And I don't necessarily think that it is, purely altruistic that that is the goal mm -hmm. um but i do think that there will be and there already is more of a push toward that sort of energy independence thing i just think there's a way better way to do it than you know these outdated electrical grid systems that we have that for real you know it gets up to 105 degrees here it everything goes off for a couple of days or a day for somebody you know it's this is not good clearly there's a problem so yeah what I was kind of getting at with the whole question too is that so America is still as of today, as of this recording, the global, mm -hmm. the global superpower, right? Um, we have enemies knocking on the door of it. But uh, I think if America wants to continue to be the global superpower and it's something that the world more likely desperately still needs, um, you don't want other, these other powers becoming higher than the United States and what look great for humanity as a whole. Um, or just the world, but Facts. I think if the U.S. wants to continue being a global superpower, then we need to be, we don't need to be a hermit kingdom, we don't need to be isolated, but we mm -hmm. do need to be at any time have the ability to shut off the outside world. Reliance on anyone else, I think, is a hindrance, regardless of what the reliance is. I think the U.S. needs to strongly consider that we need to pretty much be able to do anything on our own without the help of anything, anyone else before we start, I guess, trying to help other people or push to be more 
global or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. I know we can't just stop what we're doing now, that type of stuff. We can't just mm -hmm. like turn something off, but there needs to be a trend towards making it to where when we're at the negotiating table, they can't like hold something over us, right? It, it, it's coming down I to- I totally like, agree. That's what the Chinese have, like, are trying to do. Yes, because you have like a thing like with the whole like oil pipeline stuff from like Russia into like Germany and stuff like that, like Germany, yeah, Germany and like some Europe, other European countries, they're like, hmm, I, I can't be real hard on Russia as much as I would want to because I can't exist without their oil coming in. Like, but if you were independent, you could actually oust Russia appropriately for their heinous like acts and stuff. Well, consider, consider one of the, the positives for Russia if they were to actually take Ukraine. Right. Ukraine is the quote unquote breadbasket of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. So if Russia's controlling can control energy into Europe and then is controlling where all of this, you know, agriculture happens, like those are massive pieces on that global chessboard. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, so but anyway, it's the thought process that you're talking about, I agree with for the most part. I don't believe in isolationism. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten us into problems in the past see Japan and Pearl Harbor, right? Um, but to me, having the ability to say, I don't need you is exactly where we should be. And yes. I agree with that. We need to be able to say, cool, uh, we can produce that here, whatever it is, whether it's manufacturing of goods, whether it's the what's agricultural growth, feed people, whether it's technology and developing and you know creating advanced technologies, all that stuff needs to happen here. Right. And there's no problem with having that inner uh, the economic interdependence that should happen because the United States props up so much of that global interconnectedness that you need us and we need each other to do that. And that's exactly the way things should work. But we don't need to be going to another country and saying, hey, we need this from you now. And then to say, actually, we're going to raise the price or you're going to do this. Right. You're going to stop looking into Jamal Khashoggi's death or we're going to stop playing nice right mm -hmm. with this you know that needs to be able to be held here in the united states and kept close to the vest there's nothing wrong with having other countries and supplying them with something right to help their economy and also help us in the same turn but i agree with you we need to be able to be independent should that independence become necessary for sure and that's pretty much what i was getting at the whole thing i believe yeah. it's your question I'd be interested to hear what some people in our uh, audience have to, to say too. So leave us a comment and let us know what you think too. Yes, but please. honestly, man, one of the things I, you know, keep, keep it rolling with this stuff is talking about, let's talk about the border, right? The drug Which problem one? in this country, ours, right? So <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> Canadian and North American and American border, right? All the problems there. Um, um, chaos. No, yeah, the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> hockey fans no um you know drugs the drug problem in this country right definitely ties into the border refugees coming over we just had you know the the mayor in new york city on video like talking about how like all these 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 people living on our streets coming you know across the border are causing a problem and you know trying to say that you know my board needs to be more proactive about, you know, like taking care of this problem and, you know, we're going to be, you know, out of space for them and all the problems that they're going to cause, which I think is funny because they kind of did it to themselves. It's funny and not funny. You know what I mean? But it's ironic. There's a, thank you. There's, it's ironic. This is exactly the right word, but there's a conversation that needs to happen because this conversation is going to become a hot ticket item. The closer we get to election is what are we doing to stop this growth of, you know, drug issues here in the United States, what are we going to do with border security? Because anybody sitting here trying to say that there's not a problem there is absolutely insane. And just for people listening, we're going to have on um, a guest in November who's writing a book. He is a um, former Border Patrol agent, uh, former former uh, United States Army soldier coming on to talk about what he's seen and his experience there at the border. So I'm really excited about having him on. Um, that's going to be an outstanding conversation. But anyway, going in all that, man, like how does this problem get solved with people coming? Let's start there, right? With people coming across. I have my own ideas about how this needs to be handled. But to me, you know, I want to know, for me, I want to know what you think. 
Well, the first thing I think on how this problem could be solved is is it first needs to not be a election year only issue. Mm -hmm. If you notice that there's certain topics, the border patrol or not border, the border and securing it or not securing it, or how do we deal with refugees, all type of stuff, people coming over the drugs. They all tend to be very strong talking points for politicians and the American public mm -hmm. and news agencies eight ish months before election and the election happens and then it disappears. And then you hear nothing for three years. Right. So that's the first thing I think it needs to be addressed is we, as the American people need to be pushing our constituents, our, um, not our constituents, representation, our word, representation um, way harder into fixing this because either we like it or not, it's happening and it needs to be resolved. Uh, but my actual way on fixing it, and it's going to come off as kind of like being a dick, but a country without a border is not a country at all. So mm -hmm. right now, if the U.S. isn't can't secure its own border, then we're not we're not a global superpower, we're not a country. What will, will, will any of this matter? Um, I think we need to have a hard lockdown on the border, and just stop anything from coming over, and it it. It's going to be messy, and I understand it's going to be messy, and I understand there's kids. I understand there's actual families trying to get over. I understand there's a lot that they're running from, all this type of stuff, but the U.S. is currently full, and it cannot help mm -hmm. the people as much as we would like to or that we should be able to because we're dealing with so many little things um, that we can't get to the root of the problem. So let's just block it all off. Don't allow anything through unless it's for like official travel. Um, I would even cut off like I would I would honestly cut off any physical travel uh, over the southern border, like all the roads, unless it's like um, goods and other stuff like you couldn't like touristly go across unless you were flying. That'd be one thing I would do. Like you could fly across. You could take like a train or like a tram, but I would completely cancel uh driving across like entirely uh for any other reason except for like goods and stuff and i think that would cut down a lot on smuggling and a whole bunch of other things because they have to go through another layer of checks like good luck smuggling metric tons of cocaine or heroin or fentanyl or whatever on an airplane good luck smuggling it through like a train system right like that would mm -hmm. be more noticed um good luck smuggling people and kids Oh, hey, I'm trying to get on this aircraft to come into the United States from from Mexico or Honduras, or whatever. Yeah, these are my 20 children. Don't look at their IDs. Like, that wouldn't work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that's my take. Um, how to solve it from there, I don't really know for sure. But you have to at least secure the border first, control everything going in and out. And then once you have a bigger idea of kind of who the players are in this realm, start fixing them one by one. That's my take. So, mm -hmm. so do you mean like saying starting this day, setting up some sort of like barrier, obviously it would have to go from being like temporary to permanent. Right. Mm -hmm. And hardlining, no one coming across like, and saying from this point to this point until there's some sort of regulated um, and can completely and totally controlled access points with you know intrusion detection systems personnel all that stuff being there yep. that's what you're saying yep right and, and and because it's such a huge issue it's literally an invasion i would say military should be there there should be we should be using our predator drones and our reaper drones they should be going up and down the border all the time looking at everything mm -hmm. and they like, I'm sorry, but they might want to be so. armed, too. Mm -hmm. Like, if you've got a drug cart, like a cartel thing, and you it's a known cartel, if if we as a country can bomb a wedding on the other side of the world and kill, like, 80-plus innocents to kill one bad terrorist, then I think we're perfectly okay with bombing some cartel guys who are trying to go across our border. Mm -hmm. I don't see the difference. I don't see the issue. 
So what would you say to somebody saying you know, you're using U.S. military assets against people from another country and that being an act of war, right? Like, obviously, you're going and doing that in another country. That's yeah. an act of war, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm just like playing devil, devil's yeah, advocate that, for you. That's fine. The, the Chinese, whether you believe it or not, are knowingly trying to send people through the border oh, for sure. and it's working. We mm -hmm. have caught several times ISIS, Al Qaeda, other enemies trying to go through the border. We are being invaded. So the whole like act of war or war, it's already happening. You're mm -hmm. just not paying attention to it because in your little subdivision, you feel safe and happy, right? Mm -hmm. But it's happening and it's going on. It, it it's not it's not a matter of oh do you go to war or not like you're being invaded by an outside force you defend mm -hmm. your border I'm not saying shoot kids I'm not saying blow oh, no. up families or anything like that you can mm -hmm. definitely have a reasonable totalitarian of circumstances for why you use force right mm -hmm. but there should be the U S military there protecting the United States of America from all enemies foreign and domestic just saying yeah so i don't definitely don't disagree with you um i think that the kind of like how i interpreted what you were saying like my brain putting this together in a picture in my head is you would need personnel literally like in a line on the border right and, and you can yeah and, and you, you can would need a supplement like up front about mm -hmm. it you can just say like hey starting like it doesn't need to be tomorrow exactly you could easily, you could easily be like hey one in, Jan. Yeah, come come one January twenty twenty four, we are closing down all tourist land based travel, mm -hmm. individual travel, um, except unless you're authorized to for merchants or goods or anything like that. So every border is every border crossing is closed mm -hmm. to tourist travel. You can still fly, you can still take a train, because those are way more controlled or whatever, right? And then I would also say, come one Jan, the U.S. military will be there going up and down, securing it, checking it, all this type of stuff. Um, you are now, we're telling you now that if you're trying to sneak in like you are a refugee, an actual refugee seeking asylum or needing to escape from your country for one reason or another or to try to get our, you know, earn your liberty, your freedom, all type of stuff by coming to the U.S., we understand. Do not try to force your way over the border. You will be seen as a threat. Right now, do not force your way over the border. And then you could easily set up, you can set up a website. They all got smartphones. For what? You can set up a website that like allows refugees and stuff to easily start accessing and starting the process to like get into the United States legally. Does it need to I mean, be at a specific already, that already consulate? Exists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like you could make it way more streamlined, way more easier to use. The problem is other countries like Mexico, like specifically Mexico, they're going to want the bad to leave Mexico and just come into us. They're not going to like that we've stopped it from now leaving Mexico. And now Mexico's going to stuck mm -hmm. with it. And it causes a domino chain reaction. Now all the bad coming up from like southern America is now coming up and getting stuck in Mexico or all that type of stuff. It's like, oh, boo-hoo, secure your border too. Like, mm -hmm. if everyone secured their border, there wouldn't be this problem. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you can uh, Jamie, Jamie this real fast, but I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure there was an issue that got brought up not that long ago about um, there's an app that the maybe the Department of Homeland Security developed for people, like kind of like what you were talking about, refugees that wanted to come across the border. And essentially, it set up an appointment for them to meet with a customs officer to basically, you know, get citizenship or something like that. And essentially, what it was was just the click of a button on an app and you got an appointment. And there was no actual back end control of how this was happening. It was just telling people to show up, like all this stuff. Are you able to find something like that? Yeah, it was a U6 app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. U6 stands for United States, an acronym. Stands for United States Customs Immigration Service. And yeah, they have an app and you can just go mm -hmm. on this app and say like, I'm an asylum seeker or I'm a refugee. Mm -hmm. And as long as your questions right. meet up with what the U.S. is looking for, they will meet you. Yes, you're correct. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And, but that wasn't being regulated the way it was and the, the system itself was like overloaded where it was essentially impossible for them to go through all these requests and that's people what were just showing yeah. up with. Yeah. yeah. And so to me, it's like, I don't think a website is good enough. Right. And I think that what you're talking about, I agree with, mo you know, for the most part that you're going to have to have something like you set up a hard date and say, this is exactly when this closes, whatever loose ends you need to tie up, they need to be tied up between then and now. And after that, it's between you and God, you know? Okay. And like you said, this could sound harsh, right? It's got to be messy. There's nothing in the history of the world where it involves human beings and their lifestyles is ever clean. Right. And that's unfortunate. However, we're talking about what's you know best for our country. Okay. And once we secure and it, we make it, flat get it cleaned forward, up, we can then have a better process to mm -hmm. getting in. Well, ex exactly. Right. Yeah. And we make it flat for saying things that way, like up front, but you know, we ha things have to change. Right. And you set up literally uh, build a fucking wall. You build a wall, you have it controlled, you have it regulated, you have actual ports of entry. Um, you know, use the technology we have to monitor its avenues of approach from, you know, however out, you know, you track people coming through, you have set up, you know, create more spots for access points, right? And the other part too, that I don't hear enough that gets said is that the, the, the government from these countries needs to take accountability. The people from these countries need to take accountability of what's happening and take care of where you live, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not wrong to say that you need to sort of clean up where you live in order to be for it to be better where you're at. That's just yep. kind of the ugly truth, right? Um, our border for sure is, or our country, excuse me, is a place people want to be. And that's obvious because mm -hmm. of the things that we enjoy here. But when you talk about us not being a country because we can't secure our border, like there are so many other parallels to that that come into play. When people who aren't even citizens of this country are getting the same rights as people who are citizens or even getting breaks on things that citizens don't get, you're eroding what it means to be a citizen. And you can go back in time and we will have this conversation with another guest we're having on. You can go back in time and you can track cultures and civilizations that put emphasis in, emphasis on citizenship. You know, the Romans, for example. Mm -hmm. Being a citizen of Rome, obviously, was a lot different than what it meant here in the United States, right? You're talking about landed gentry, money, owning land, being a man, all this other stuff. That's not the way it is here in the United States anymore, right? Because it used to be, you know, very focused on landed gentry as well. There's a lot of different things that go into citizenship. And one of those things is enjoying the rights of that country. And if you're saying that you can just come in illegally and not go through the processes to become a citizen, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. You're eroding what it means to be a citizen and you're taking away a foundational piece of that, you know, what it means, that ethereal, what it means to be an American. Right. And if if it doesn't matter, it's kind of like the conversation we had that time about, you know, there's conservatism and liberalism. Right. And people feel today that there's nothing left to conserve. Yes. And it's partly because the, of the erosion. That's exactly what. Yeah. It, partially because of the erosion of what it means to be a citizen. And this has happened in history and it's written about and mm -hmm. track and how these things when when Rome basically said all barbarians can get citizenship, right? All those privileges that, you know, came with quote unquote privileges came with being a Roman citizen. They now don't mean just as much as they did before. It's just like anything supply and demand. If you flood the, the economy with something that is supposed to be rare and its value is, you know, derived from its rarity, it is no longer rare and does not mean, or is no longer worth what it was before. And so, it's not just the border that matters. It's when you tell people they can come in here and they can get a driver's license and they don't have to go through the process of becoming you know, a citizen, but they can go use that driver's license. And you, some people want people to be able to go vote, 
right? And then what kind? What what city was it um, that w- was floating the idea of having that um, if you were not a citizen yet, you could be a police officer? That's just insane to me. Like, how much of a slap in the face to being Probably an California. American citizen is it? I don't think it's California. Actually, part of me wants to say it was might have been like Chicago, maybe. Um, of a slap in the face is it to say that you can be policed by somebody who's not even a citizen of your country? That's insane. That's wild. That'd be like if it was mm-hmm. the Chinese had police stations in the country where they just arrest people. Well, oh, what they do? <laughs> Ridiculous. I'm well, trying to find Google. A, yeah, I'm trying to find a. It's Illinois. Yeah. The state of Illinois will allow so some, not just the city of Chicago. Will allow some non citizens to be police, but only blah blah blah. There's like some stipulation or whatever. I was looking up walls though. There was a stipulation. Uh I'd have to click on it. What was okay? I'm trying to read. Um, All I was trying to say is essentially is that you bring up the point about the border and how we can't be a country if we don't have a defined border and we don't have defined processes for coming people coming into our country and being citizens. And that is something that you can see throughout history is when you have the erosion of the citizenship and what it means to be a citizen and what it means to be a member of that group, then you no longer have people willing to conserve the ideals that uphold what it means to be an American or Roman or whatever. That all goes away. And it becomes this nihilistic void of nothing matters because everything is permitted and everything is okay. And these are the signs and marks and tells of a society in collapse. End of story. I agree. Uh, The stipulations, they have to be a lawful permanent resident. Mm Mm-hmm. So not quite a citizen yet, but they're allowed to be here and work and do all that type of stuff. So is it like kind of like the thing where like um, if you wanted to gain your citizenship through military service, you could be in the military and not a citizen yet? Is that kind of what it is? Yeah. So, using... so they're they're becoming okay. citizens at some point and they're really like through mm-hmm. parts of the process. That's that one was more. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was looking up gotcha. walls. So that's not as bad. Yeah. I just want to say that make this point real quick that it. If that's truly what it is, that you can earn your citizenship by being a police officer, I think that that's definitely not as bad as what I was thinking. And I need to say that, Um, you know, I do think that there's a conversation to be had about being policed by somebody who um, is not a citizen of your country. But if you're earning your citizenship through being a police officer and on the same token, you can become a member of the United States by joining the military and potentially dying, right, for this country, then those sorts of things are 100%. That's a, that concept is okay with me. If you, can, if you can earn your citizenship protecting people in your community just as much as you can earn your citizenship by taking up arms and potentially dying as a member of the military, okay. Yeah, I agree. I, I, can, see, I can see that. Um, I was looking up walls. And if they yes. work, okay, right. And they work surprisingly well. Um, oh. So Israel put up a wall mm-hmm. up against in like the Gaza Strip areas Bro, and stuff. So their Iron Dome. Yeah, they put up a wall in two thousand four, June two thousand four. Mm-hmm. So the year up to June of two thousand four, they had roughly uh, twenty one thousand unlawful breaches of their border. Mm -hmm. Um, that they are aware of. Uh, They had 200 or 411 people killed by uh, people outside coming in and like bombing or attacking or anything like that, right? They're at war and they've been at war for a very long time. Um, But they've decided to build a wall. So in June Mm -hmm. 2004, they built a wall. Uh, Unauthorized entries went down to 19. 21,000 to 19 the following year. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. deaths went from 411 to zero and they have had zero deaths from a border crossing issue or whatever since June of 2004. Um, their mm. wall, they have a lot of other issues. That's for sure. That's but... true. But their wall is quite extensive. Um, the whole thing is roughly, uh, it's 160 feet wide and it's mm-hmm. like, it's like, like an onion, it's layers. So mm-hmm. they have an initial barbed wire, just simple area where they all they clear out all the vegetation. And there's just barbed wire. Then they have 
uh, surveillance cameras and sensors that are detecting any movements on the barbed wire. Then there is a big sand empty space where it can be easily observed. And it's like a very loose mm -hmm. sand and it goes super far deep. So people can't like dig holes or whatever because it would just fall in on itself. Um, mm -hmm. Then there is a mm -hmm. very high uh, 18 foot wall, like concrete wall. Um, mm -hmm. And it's at a sloped angle away from Israel. So you can't like climb mm -hmm. up it and it's got mm -hmm. barbed wire on top. On the other side of the wall, they have a four lane road in most places, sometimes a two lane road, where it constantly has patrols going up and down it. Then there is another like wall that's just like barbed wire, but it's pretty high too, kind of what you see like at a military installation where it's like mm -hmm. aimed a certain way. Then there is a big ditch and then more barbed wire and then like a nice little fence for the Israel side. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no one's getting through that. So it works very well. It's pretty intricate. It is very intricate. Also, Israel has way less of a border than the U.S. has, but at least size-wise. Oh, yeah. Dude, that's one of the things, like, when I, being being uh, stationed with and working with people from other countries, and I try to explain just, like, how big the United States is, you can travel three hours across Europe and hit three different countries. You can't even leave the majority of states <laughs> within three hours. Yeah. Like if you left, if you departed from the middle of the state and drove three hours in one direction, there's a good chance you're not leaving that state unless you're, you know, in one of those New England states that you could pretty much pay to carpet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dude, I try telling people, like, people always forget how big Florida is in general, you know. Oh, just drive down. Like, yeah, you prepared, be prepared for a 16-hour day. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? If you're willing to just go, you know, stopping for gas and food. It's just crazy. The United States is huge. You're right. It is but, massive. Yeah. Pretty massive. I mean, to, to me, man, like the this the problem with the the drugs, like this is that's you know too big of a problem to sit here and have a conversation about, like exactly. But the fentanyl issue, the fentanyl crisis coming across the border, like that, I think is one of those these issues, right? Having to put the pressure on cities to take care of people that are leaving, you know, their country. There are because there are a ton of people that are leaving for legitimate reasons, right? Who wants yep. to live around cartels? Um, but it would solve both of those problems, in my opinion. You know, the st the helping the stop the flow of the the drug trade coming across the border there. And obviously, there's there's going to be things that keep coming across, and there's going to be other ways that people get in. You're going to have to do, you know, the um, what's it called, ground radar to find tunnels because there are tunnels for sure. Yep. Ground, ground ground penetrating radar to find tunnels and all that stuff, but you know, if you can sit here and please, if you have, if you want to criticize what we said, you know, and you have a better way, you know, we're all ears. And obviously Zach and I aren't solving issues that anybody's going to give a shit about and go out there and implement and put into practice. But if you have a better way, by all means, you know, say it. But to me, it's just like, it's got to start somewhere. And this is one of those things where when we were talking to um, Peaches, when I was talking to Peaches last episode, I, I don't remember who said it, but a good plan now is better than a perfect plan later. And this is like one of those things where it's like, you know, we've we've played this this stutter step game of what are we going to do and making it a political issue when really it should just be an American issue because we are losing ground in our own country and people are being affected by it. You know, when mm -hmm. the, the mayor of New York City is saying they're all going to be out on their asses here in a couple of years because of this problem, like you can say what you want about New York City and, you know, the people that live there and its politics or whatever, but it's still to, an American to lose a city. city, it's still an American city. It's still part of our economy, right? It's, yep. you know, just that whole notion of who, of fuck them right? Because they're in California or they're in Oregon or New York or whatever, or Iowa, the fly, the flyover states, like people say, that's, mm -hmm. that's complete total opposite think of what people should be thinking. If you want to have a country, then you want to be successful. I wanted to say this too, real quick, on top of what you said about the Chinese overtaking the United States. I saw an article today that our buddy Sino put out from another um, a group that kind of does stuff along the same lines as he does is now Forbes, I want to say it was Forbes or Bloomberg, that the Chinese, because of everything that they're facing right now with their economic collapse essentially going on, that they're no longer estimated to overtake the United States as the global power, 
that at some point around 2040, they will dip up above the United States and come right back down. And that estimates. So it's that's, not what new, that's, what, that's what new estimates are saying because of the, the basically starting with their no blank policies and you know the collapse of their economy not to mention you know you you can't really treat your people that way and expect to to last you know you don't need to look that far back in history to see how well that went for other places so mm -hmm. but um mm -hmm. you know anyway yeah that's our yeah. very quick 30 minute take on all that i guess but i think it's your <laughs> I think take. it's your question thanks for your take. question bro yes it is uh, i did want to touch on one thing you kind of brought up though you're talking about mm -hmm. how like it doesn't matter if it's california or new york whatever it's still part of like america Mm -hmm. I saw, uh, so President Biden, I believe, went down to Florida for like, did a hurt, there was a hurricane somewhere. I mm -hmm. think it was Florida. Yeah. Yep. And so President Italian. Biden like went down there and he said, we're going to get aid there like immediately and stuff. And he actually did, I'll give credit, did a pretty good job of getting what they needed there immediately, all type of stuff. And it was uh, kind of right. Um, but the, the thing that I saw is there was like, uh, I saw on the internet, there was like, set, like a lot of liberals specifically like celebrities who were like, why are you helping them? They didn't vote for you. Oh. They were against you. Like, da, 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 da. And it's like, that's not, that doesn't make sense. Regardless mm -hmm. of where you fit on the party line, you're still an American. You are part of the problem if that's the way you think. Exactly. When I saw that, I was like, that's so, like, it's bigoted. That's so stupid. Like, you're an idiot. And, yeah, and it's any of that, man. It's what I was getting yeah. at. I've seen plenty of people who are Republicans or conservatives being mm -hmm. exactly, you know, fuck them, fuck them. It's California. They deserve it. You know what I mean? It's, no. And and believe me, there <laughs> are consequences. There are consequences to your actions mm -hmm. when you don't do anything to actually solve homelessness and the drug problem going on in your state or your country or whatever. Like you're a part of the problem too, right? Yep. You know, just saying fuck those people because they live there. I think they think this way. Like that's that's not the right answer at all. I actually thought you were going to say about how he got called out for, for helping out Florida and being there, but not going to East Palestine and Ohio after that train derailment. Well, but you don't hear about that at all either. Right. Too, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just pointed, they're just pointing out the uh, discrepancy there. Yeah. He didn't even go, which is interesting. That's not important weird. to him. There's not enough voters there. <laughs> but no, the, uh, uh, my next question. Um, this is kind of uh, this could either go into a long discussion or it's just like a quick like get it over what type of thing. Uh, but my question for you uh, is: Is Vladimir Putin dead, bro? This is such an interesting question. Um, <laughs> my instincts, my instinct tells me no. Okay, right. But I do think that he is not well, and I think that he has many doubles, right? And there's tons of video out there of these doubles making mistakes that don't fit in line with his characteristics or his, you know, body movements and yeah, these things that ear, he does. All right. that stuff. Yeah. And so I just think that, you know, he knows that his life may be in danger. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um but it just kind of begs the question, like, if, if he's not dead, this is why my instinct says he's alive. I just don't think there's enough party line, you know, toters right out there that in, in Russia that are like, you know what, we're just going to keep this going forever. You know what I mean? I think it is 100% coming from him. And if there was, you know, just body doubles running the country with generals or whatever oligarchs are in charge, you know, I just don't think, I think it would be over. You know what I mean? Part, that's just my initial yeah, take on that. What do you think? Yeah, they can't keep the facade on for like oh, I, forever. I just think they wouldn't even want to is what I'm getting at. I think that he's, he's the impetus completely. Okay. Or the arbiter of all of it. So there's a, there is a, Report early September report. Uh, looks like it's September eighth. Uh, not not. It's like two days ago. Um, the Ukrainian spy chief, which he is mm -hmm. a major general, he is making the argument that Putin is dead, and that Putin has been mm -hmm. dead since at least July nineteenth, twenty twenty two. How did he die? How was like his? 
he Dude. thinks it was just a health issue and he just died or whatever. And that uh, the country has been kind of doing what you've been saying. They've been using doubles and a bunch of other stuff. Because he's, mm -hmm. he's got a whole bunch of like pictures and he's got a whole write-up and everything talking about how the Putin the world knows was last seen 19 July 2022 in Tehran um, when he walked back up his steps to his uh, aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, but, he had, but apparently that Putin hasn't been seen since. Um, and then he's arguing that some of the uh, videos that like Russia has released about like the Ukraine war and stuff, they're mm -hmm. not specific enough. They're like, just like, oh, Russia's great. We will win. Da, 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 da. They were like pre-recorded mm -hmm. by the actual Putin. And uh, it's because they don't have any like distinct dates. And mm -hmm. in a lot of his videos that Putin releases recently, they don't talk about a significant event or a date or a thing that's happened, they're all kind of vague, just about the war in Ukraine. So they're th wondering if, like, they're, they're, they're saying that he's dead and that he's been dead So for a how while. does this whole, like, supposed attempted coup with Wagner group tie into that then? I'm not sure, but I'm wondering... It's like, obviously, Progrosian, that's the whole question too, right? Is he yeah. dead? That's the, that's the thing too, is he dead? It, or is it just an elaborate ruse for him to just kind of like escape it all and now be somewhere where he can just kind of live the rest of his life without being scrutinized or mm -hmm. under the media thumb or whatever? When when was that meeting between the Chinese um, and Putin where like Xi shook Vladimir Putin's hand and said something like, you know, what we're doing now has never been done before or whatever? Like, when was that? Xi meets Putin. Let's find out. It was in March. It was a while of ago. 23? Yeah. So Xi Jinping just met with a body double? Like, I'm not going to lie, though. That you know? he, the Putin looks off. Like, he looks off. It's in his, it's in his report. This, that picture is actually in this guy's report. The general from Ukraine. Because, like, think it's about this. It's just one of those things where it's like, think, think about okay, this. go ahead. What if, mm -hmm. what if when Xi says... We're doing something we've that's never been done before. He's like, we're running Me. like China is running Russia with a body double. Like, <laughs> I mean, I guess if you think about it that way, that kind of answers my question. Like, why keep it going if it, you know, I guess if it's serving some sort of Chinese interest, because it's just China in, mm -hmm. in disguise. I mean, that also keeps with our like running tradition. You know, of saying that China is running Russia anyway, right? Mm -hmm. like Vladimir Putin's got to ask Xi whether he can have, you know, frosted flakes or or Lucky Charms. But what's interesting about the whole thing, though, is if you have, if Putin's dead, right, and you're using body doubles or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's like, why would your body doubles have health ailments? That you just like train them to pretend does, like they have ailments. But like, why though? Does it make it? Does it make it more real? I guess. I guess because it like, does. It, it it adds credence to the would add credence to the ruse, I suppose. Yeah. If he's all of a sudden healthy. That seems suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if like I every guess. time I see you, you you are sick, and then I don't. I see you after a short period of time where you could not have recovered, and you're mm -hmm. completely and totally healthy. Like that would be really weird. I'd be like, what the fuck happened? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because the, the the other caveat too is uh, Putin has not traveled by air since that Tehran visit mm. at all. Now, Aubrey, that's my cat. Sorry, <laughs> Puma. Hey, <laughs> but he he hasn't traveled by air since that Tehran thing too. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if he. Zach is muting his his micro fast. His cat's over there dying, apparently. Uh, no, man, I, I don't know. Uh, you said it was from a Ukrainian general. So to me, it's like one of these things was like, consider the source. Like, wouldn't that be pretty good propaganda? And, you know, to say that Putin is dead, you know, the leader of your, your enemy has has perished, you know, in a way to 
try to a deflate any sort of morale that still exists on the Russian side and then create some sort of morale for your Ukrainian troops. And I don't know, just it's like one of these things like consider the source, I suppose. And then like, to me, it's just like, <clears throat> did, you know, would did Prigozhin just think that like, maybe he knew that Putin was dead. So he tries to exact this coup and then, you know, maybe, I don't know, whatever puppet government is in existence said, hey, man, G said, knock it off. You know what I mean? I don't know. Like, there's just a lot of questions and things. Or did he, like, think that Putin may be dead and he tries to, you know, take over the country? Or, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to, like, make that make sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, I guess. And I'm, like, trying to force a, I think, a square peg through a round hole now. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the... Uh... Because the source is Ukraine. Only Ukraine, only Ukraine is saying this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they just now, like in the last week, started saying it. So they've been compiling evidence this whole time or whatever to make it more real and compelling or whatever. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if it's just a way for Ukraine to just like be like, Putin, you're, you're so far gone that we think you're a body double. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're such a weak leader that we don't even think you're alive anymore. Like you've failed at everything, um, that uh, yeah, you, you might as well be dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's what it did, is. It's a stat. Did, did Russia go to the G twenty thing? No, they don't go to those anymore. It's like the G eight or not G eight. The um, well, they made a big deal about Xi Jinping not going to the G twenty. So I was just kind of wondering, Russia in G twenty. I don't think Putin went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Putin did not go to G20. Did a Russian what? delegation go? Yes. Mm. Russia went, but Putin did not go. Biden went. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So did a whole bunch of other leaders. Yeah, I saw like Justin Trudeau was there. But not Putin. Interesting. Putin's probably afraid to be murdered, or he's dead. Probably, or he's dead. <laughs> I don't know. My just my instinct says that he's not dead. I think he's severely ill, though, and he's probably mm -hmm. going to be dead in the next five, ten years. Well, let's just let's just assume he's alive, right? Mm -hmm. Would they even tell us he died of cancer or whatever he has? No. They would say he was poisoned or that he was murdered by some Ukraine thing as more spark to continue the war and to keep at it. If he died hmm. naturally, they would say, we have proof that like Ukraine, along with help from the U.S. and probably some other NATO countries, mm -hmm. formulated a plot and they assassinated Putin. Hmm. Because Russia, it was a couple weeks ago, even they said that we have full right and ability to go to war with any NATO country at any time. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I think he's alive. Right. I do think that he, he's very much, that she kind of has his hand up Putin's ass running his mouth, though, personally. Yeah. He's, okay. he's physically alive. Mm -hmm. He's morally dead. Morally dead. Yeah. I think he's been morally dead for a long time, though. Yeah. What is the most wholesome thing that's ever happened to you? The most wholesome thing that's ever happened to me? Mm-hmm. <sighs> so you came up with a question, which means you probably already have an idea of something wholesome for you. Right? No. You don't? Okay. No. I was going to use that time to think of a wholesome, wholesome, most wholesome thing that's mm. ever happened to me. The most nice try, wholesome, Zach. I know. I needed to think for a moment. Most wholesome thing? I can't. I can't think of like a very specific thing that'd be. I don't know. I'm trying to think of like someone doing a really good deed for me or like someone like taking care of me or helping me out in my time of need, but hardly ever in a time of need. But the uh, um, 
I don't know. I would say probably the most wholesome thing would probably be my wife saying yes to marrying me. I don't. Oh my god. I don't. I don't know. I mean, because I'm trying to think of like something that was like so nice, and mm-hmm. I didn't think would actually happen, and rewarding, and all that mm-hmm. type of stuff. And it, it'd probably be her saying, "Yeah, I'll marry your bald head." So, oh, okay, just your bald head. <laughs> just my bald head. Your bald head. Okay. I mean, I feel like that's an easy answer. It is an easy answer. I'm trying to you... think of something different, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, sure. Like I could say the same thing, I guess, but. uh yeah, I, like, you know what's funny is you said to me that, oh, do you have an answer? I couldn't think of something where I was like, that stands out so profoundly to me as this immediately or amazingly wholesome thing that's happened to me where I'm like, oh my God, just yeah. pure goodness. You, you know? see, what's, what's interesting with that is I know for sure I've had a lot of like good, wholesome moments, but for I think sure. it kind of just stems on the... Like when, like I'm in car groups and no one is like praising that their car started. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, my mm-hmm. came to the group today to tell you guys my car started. And I was able to drive to work with no issues. It was great. No one does Praise that. Praise God. Yeah, everyone complains. You always remember mm-hmm. negativity more than you remember positivity mm-hmm. usually. So mm-hmm. I think like when you try to think of something, what's something wholesome that happened to you? It's kind of harder to think of. Mm-hmm. I know in like recruiting duty. I've had a ton of parents like call me and like thank me for helping like their kid. I think that's wholesome. Um, I've been given like uh, like gifts and stuff from some of them or whatever as like thanks. I've gotten huge like texts from like airmen that I put in who are like, I would have never done this or done that or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. I think it's wholesome. Um, I thought of something. What you got? So in 2015, I went. And visited my grandmother, my mom's mom. We called her uh, Mama. We went and visited her, me, my ex, and our daughter. And um, it was at Christmas time. And my daughter was really young. Um, my mama knew I was coming. And she, mind you, has been really sick for a long time. Um and doesn't feel very well. Doesn't get up and do a lot. And growing up, man, she decorated for Christmas like you. You ever seen Home Alone two? When you know he goes into that department store, like in all the Christmas decorations with like the trains and like the you know the dolls and the toys and all that stuff. Like that's how ham she went at Christmas time in her yeah. house. Like she had like three Christmas trees. It was it was crazy, right? And um, she knew how much I really loved that as a kid. And then obviously I moved away because my dad joined the Air Force and I I couldn't even tell you if I had another actual Christmas on Christmas Day with her since I was like maybe five, right? Mm -hmm. Something around there. Anyway, she, we used to talk about that, how much I used to love, like how she decorated the house for Christmas. And um, it's definitely why I like a lot of decorations. But knowing just how sick she was, right? She decorated her house for me like she had when I was a kid. Like, she went ballistic. Like, you know what I mean? And she was still setting up when, like, we pulled up in her driveway at, like, 7 o'clock at night. Right? Exhausted. Mm -hmm. And she purely did it just for me because I was visiting her. And, um, Coincidentally, she died that coming August. So, you know, I haven't even thought about it that way since I posed the question to you. But that, you know, that was literally the last Christmas I got to spend with her. And she decorated her house for me. So that like, you know, that did in this moment just like occur to me that like, that's incredibly wholesome. And she loved me that much to go ham in her old age, you know, with diabetes and all the things happening to her to decorate the house. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, my Aunt Ruth, she's like 80-something. She's still alive, 80 or 90-something. She's always dying. She, That's her joke. She's always, like, dying. We're expecting her to pass away sometimes. She just keeps kicking. Um, but she always makes treats. Um, 
and she's got real bad arthritis. So her like cooking and stuff is still really hard to mm -hmm. do. But every year for my birthday, I still get a box um, of like these rolled like cinnamon cookie things that she sends me every single year, even though I know that that was probably really hard for her to do. Mm -hmm. That's wholesome. That'd be a wholesome thing. Very. Yeah, yeah, man. You see, it's hard. It's hard to think of the the good things. Someone doing a it genuine, is. happy, good act for you. Because mm -hmm. I, I bet I have at least one a day, several times a day even, but mm -hmm. just don't think about them. Yeah. And I'll say this, man, like my wife has done a lot of very kind things for me and she does them very often, you know, so those are all wholesome yeah. too. You my, know, and not when I, when I wrote the question down, I was thinking of like one event and eventually yeah. I came to that point to think about that Christmas, her mm -hmm. decorating for me. And obviously like. You know, at the time, I really appreciated it. I felt bad that she did that. I was like, oh, you didn't have to do that because she didn't tell me she was going to do it. She just did it, you know. Mm -hmm. But now, like, I've thought about it before, you know, in hindsight and, you know, thought about that it was special. But, like, you know, it didn't occur to me when I wrote that question down that that, you know what I mean? And it really, when you talk about it out loud, because they're not, like, talked about it out loud to anybody, um, you know. But it, it is. It's like that's that is. It's like incredibly wholesome. It's something mm -hmm. like you expect from a grandmother when you know if everybody has these expectations and thought thoughts about what grandmothers are. You know, she nailed it. That's awesome. That's an awesome mm -hmm. memory to have forever too. For sure. Yeah. But anyway, what uh, what you got, bro? All right. So I have a daughter coming into this world soon. You End do. Of January is when she will be born. We don't have a name yet, so don't ask me. Um, it's she's going to be born on my birthday. When's, what's your exact birthday, Brandon? 29 January. 29 January? So she's she's expected 25 January. So we'll she'll be a see. couple of days late. Tell not to me to yeah. hold it in. Hold it in. Let it let it cook a couple more, mm -hmm. couple more days. Yep. Um, you have a daughter. And mm -hmm. having known you for a while... Uh, and I used to uh, call you jokingly, but not also not full jokingly, father, because I... you kind of just give off this very good father presence, advice, knowledge, all that type of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. What are tips you have for me raising a daughter? Ooh, that's a good question. First off, congratulations again to you. Everybody listening, if you haven't known already, um, I'll say this, man, your kid in, in general, right? Let me give you some like general advice before like give you like daughter advice. Okay. Your kids know and absorb way more than you realize they do. Um, and, uh, it, it'll surprise you when you kind of realize that and you'll see it very, very often, you know, when they're super little, because just consider like all the changes that happen when you have a little kid, you'll notice them because they'll go one day where they're like, you know, they can't use a fork very well, but they're trying. And then the next day at breakfast, they're stabbing their eggs and putting them in their mouth. Like they've been doing it, you know, and you, you'll notice it and you will, because the changes are so profound, you know, mm -hmm. and these little, they're little changes, but they're really, really big. And, um, you know, so your kids notice everything you freaking do, literally, and it'll come out and show itself in ways that you wouldn't even think about. And like I said, it'll like kind of catch you by surprise. But one moment I remember, like the first time I kind of like really remember that happening where it's like, you know, my daughter was really, really little. I want to say maybe she was like two or close to being two. And um, she was sitting on my lap, like facing me and like, we were like kind of playing around and she went to like, she pretended to like kind of hit me in the face. You know what I mean? And um, she wasn't angry or anything like that, but like, I pretended like it hurt. Right. I was like, Oh, you know, or whatever I did. Mm -hmm. And dude, like she immediately got this like super like regret face, sad, sad monkey, like, Oh my God. And like, reached her hand out and put her hand on my cheek and like 
she started to like tear up when they, these tears were coming down and she like mm. put her face on mine, like nose, like forehead to nose. Like, and I was like, Oh my God. Like I, I felt so bad. You know what you I mean? That, like, <laughs> yeah. Well, like I would just, I was just playing along, you know, mm. wasn't trying to make her feel bad, but she thought I hurt that she hurt me, you know? Yeah. And, um, she showed so much empathy and concern for me at such a young age. I, I will always remember that, you know, it was just like that caught me off guard. Like I remember it cause I felt like an asshole for pretending like she hurt me <laughs> and then she got upset about it, you know? Yeah. But, but I, this, the level of empathy and care and concern for me that she held at that young of an age like I would not have at the time thought that they, that she could feel and exhibit to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I guess I, what I'd say is like, remember that your kids really and truly are watching and they're picking up way more than, you know, and they, they are, they're always going to catch you off guard and they're always going to surprise you. Um, and some other advice I'd give you is, you're going to have days where you feel like just a fucking asshole. And, you know, especially when you, your kids get older and you have to start disciplining them. Cause I'll tell you right now, man, like there are so many times where I've just said in my brain, I wish you would just listen and do what I, it is I'm asking you to do. So you right? have to because, them. but it didn't, because so I didn't have to discipline them because I just want to have a good day. I just want to take you to the store, you know, I just want to take you to the playground, like all this stuff. Right. And that's what being a parent is. And it's difficult to discipline and you have to find the right way to do it and all that stuff. And that's what being a parent is. So you're never going to escape that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when you put the kids to bed, you put the kid to bed, you're going to think about everything you did that day. And you're going to beat yourself up and you're going to be like, fuck, man, I, I got way more angry than I should have about this, you know? And, you know, you, I have these internal conversations all the time about, all right, I'm not going to lose my patience with that next time. And then, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, you know, or, um, you know, I'm going to be more proactive to, to give praise for certain things, you know? Um, and it's like one of those things where you remember is like life gets in your way too of, of parenting, you know, and so life gets in their way of, of a lot of things too. It's just, it's honestly one of those things where you you got to trust the system almost that you're going to get over or they're going to come out okay you know because you care and you're doing your best yeah and that you're never going to have perfect days and I, I'll say this too like um Demi's mom makes the joke that like she says you know I know I screwed up I'll pay for therapy you know what I mean <laughs> and you know I didn't hand, I didn't parent every situation the right way or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, but, and it's kind of, but it's, it's, she said that before. And I, I remember it because I kind of tell myself that, that like, you know, I don't need to be so hard on myself about these things because every parent struggles with them. So just remember, man, that like you love your kid and you're doing what's best for them and they'll see that too. And you know, it'll be really hard and be so many times where like, and I'll say this too, dude, there's so much shit that I didn't even appreciate about my own parents until I had a kid. And there's going to be stuff that like, you don't even realize, you know, any of the now, like you're in, you're anticipating being a dad, but, and you're a really smart guy, but there's going to be things that you realize when you become a parent and you start parenting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just like these connections and that your brain makes and these emotions that you can only feel if you have a kid, which is why you're not a, a mom. If you're a dog mom, get over it, <laughs> you know? Um, but it's just like, or a dad, if you're a dog dad, right. Yeah. Whatever. That's not the same in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, so give yourself, give yourself some, some room to make mistakes, right. Um, know that you're going to make them and, and that the next day is going to be a fresh day and that kids, kids are way more resilient than you think they are. Um, and it's something I, I heard one time too, sorry if I'm rambling, but hey, is that, good. it's all great advice. Um, yeah, that, oh, I appreciate it. Try not to tell your kids to be careful when they're doing something, but tell them to look out or be mindful. Right. Um, 
that way they're not overly cautious about everything they're doing, but they're paying attention to what they're doing, even if there is an element of danger, because life is dangerous. Heard that before. Right? Yeah. And I try to do that. And I catch myself saying like, be careful. Or I'll, then I'll be like, fuck, you know, and I'll be like, well, watch <laughs> out, for, watch out for the edge of the sidewalk or watch out for the curb instead of saying, be careful. Because if mm -hmm. you're saying be careful, you're just like initiating this, it's like potentially like, the sense of thing. like, yeah, sense of like fear. Oh, shit. Nothing specific. You know what I mean? But yeah. if I say, hey, watch out for the sidewalk or the curb or watch out, watch your head or whatever, you know, then there's more intent behind what you're saying. You know what I mean? You're like building those like connections to like be environmentally aware because, dude, kids have no sense of self-preservation at all. Like my son, <laughs> like we take him to the pool. He just wants to live at the bottom of the pool. Like he thinks that that's fine. You know, it's like, no, we we have to let me you have to let me hold you. Or you have to be in your floaty thing or whatever, you know, it doesn't, it's like, no, have to be in the pool. Like, have you, you know, have you seen those videos where the pool thing reminded me, where they take like, the, mm -hmm. they're like infant, like mm -hmm. they're like new baby and they mm -hmm. just put him in the pool. And Dude, like, I've seen that, man. That's... And like the baby, like just knows to turn around and then mm -hmm. like start like breathing properly. I'm like, yep. what the heck? Like, yeah, man. one, I how do you as a parent like do that hope you just hope that your kids are going to not die like what the heck i mean it's a so there's i've seen those before and like i i would give that a shot with like somebody who does that mm -hmm. um because it's a controlled environment you know what yeah. i mean like it always there's always the risk of like your kid inhaling water and then like dry drowning later or whatever you know which is a very real thing and people think i'm kidding when i've told them about dry drowning is a real thing um but explain to the listeners like how does that work um so I, this is not medical advice i'm not a doctor but um if you want to understand it happens is when kids are i think it can happen to adults but i think kids are more susceptible to it but you aspirate like water into your lungs and it causes some sort of irritation to where your lungs start like overproducing like mucus or whatever and essentially and the symptoms of it suck because they if you spend all day at the pool, what are you going to be? You're going to be tired, right? And one of the indications of it happening is fatigue. And um, it's because like the oxygen in your blood is being depleted or whatever. Mm. And what, and this just sucks, right? And it's really sad, but it happens to kids because they come home and they go to sleep and they don't wake up and they drown because of their lungs right and this is what's called dry drowning so like there's always that risk of like you know inhaling water and something like that happening and you got to pay attention and all this shit right mm -hmm. and and i'm you know that's my explanation on what that was and look it up but it's a real thing dry drowning um but anyway you know i would try i would try that you know what i mean because and i think it's very good to teach kids safety around water mm -hmm. um and teach them how to swim from a really young age because Dude, you never, you just fucking never know, dude. Um, so, but it is, dude, my wife has showed me videos of that and she's like, fuck no, dude. This is like <laughs> one of this like little kid on the edge of the pool and like the, the like trainer or whatever, or like mom or like mom. Yeah. Mom's in the pool, like looking up at her and the trainer's just like, yeet. <laughs> like shoves this kid in the pool and you're not supposed to grab him, which has got to go against every instinct you yes. have as a parent, you know? Yes. But then they like do that, like, <gasps> you know, and they're like kicking and moving their arm and they're, they're fine, you know? And then you like get them out, you know? But well, it's like, like this, but like, it's like the same, like if you, you take a dog, mm -hmm. if you take like a puppy, like now obviously like a puppy can walk pretty like on its own, all type of stuff. So like a human that takes like years mm -hmm. to figure this stuff out, but you can take like a dog, you throw it in a pool, like instantly starts dog pounding. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. never seen it ever in its life. It immediately yeah. knows how to survive in this environment. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we are still animals. There are still instincts. So I think like Maybe teaching, it's just one of those things that we young, lost with evolution to instinctually do that without having to be taught or reminded. You know what yeah. I mean? Because well, like obviously people drown all the time because they don't know how to swim. Yeah. Not Sumi and I were going through, we made our baby registry yesterday, right? And so we're going through and we're like looking at stuff like Amazon suggests or whatever. And there's a, like several times where both her and I were like, we don't need that. Why mm -hmm. is this a thing that it says we need? And in my mm -hmm. mind, I was like thinking literally like 20 years ago, this didn't exist. And we mm -hmm. had plenty of babies before then. And then some of the stuff. Yeah, so I always like, think about it. Like, like how did the ancient Egyptians get by without, yeah. what, you know? 
Yeah, it's exactly. Like, it's like I think we'll be all right without that. We don't need that. Mm-hmm. Or like, yeah, dude, that's for sure, dude. There's gonna be so much shit that you'll see that you're like, oh, this could come in handy, and you never use it. Um, like we bought this thing um, that essentially you strap the baby into, and it like kind of rocks them, makes this rocking motion. Mm-hmm. Or I guess it's good for like colic and stuff like that. My kid hated it, bro. And this thing was like 250 bucks. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, you have a cat. You know how freaking r- ridiculous those things are. Mm-hmm. You buy them these toys and they prefer the box that it came in. You know what I mean? That's how kids are. You know, just they just, toys just never know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. But it's just like kind of like how kids are, man. Like there's no need to go ham, bro. Like yeah. your, your kid, when they get to that point, mm-hmm. is going to enjoy playing outside with you in the playground way more than they're going to enjoy being distracted with toys, mm-hmm. you know? And that's, that's like the one thing I'll really say, man, is I've learned is that, you know, it's, it's presence over presence. You know what I mean? And you know, your kids will fucking, they know, dude, like, they know when you're busy and mm-hmm. you can't give them that attention. Cause that's when you'll start getting like the acting out. And like my kid uh, likes to just throw shit into cups because like, we'll leave like a coffee mug on the, the, the coffee table or something mm-hmm. and just run over. And like the other day he tried to do it with my AirPods and luckily my wife caught him. Um, but I was, you know, I was doing something and she was doing something and he just walked over there and like kind of looked at her with my AirPods and my my bad you know it's not his fault that he that he had them um but uh yeah it's just you know kids kids know how to push your buttons too so it's just always one of those things man where like a little bit goes a long way sometimes when it comes with like instruction and teaching them and mm-hmm. consistency and consistently doing things i feel like um and there's always going to be those things where like you have done literally everything you can do to try and fix the situation or make them happy. And I'm not even just talking about like when they're a baby, because sometimes babies just cry. And by the way, that's the easiest stage, bro. When they are immobile and all they do is poop, sleep and cry, dude, that's the <laughs> easiest freaking time. I'm telling you, man, like the getting up at night sucks and all of that. And, you know, I don't know how you guys intend on trying to feed your kid, you know, whether it's naturally or bottle fed or whatever, yeah. but I'm telling you, like, that's the easiest because you can go wherever you want, really. You know what I mean? As long as you pack a bag. But, mm-hmm. you know, when they're two and throw a temper tantrum at the grocery store all the time, it's like, well, do, do maybe you just go and I'll stay here? Like, instead of all of us going and it turning into a nightmare on the cereal aisle or whatever, you know? So, uh, man, it's it's an adventure, bro. And you're going to do a great job. Just, you know, you, know, you know, closing that up, I would say, dude, just just give yourself patience. And be or be patient with yourself. Understand you're not going to have all the answers, and you know your kids are going to be okay at the end of the day because you care and you're doing your best, and that's what they deserve, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a. I've already been pretty shocked with, uh, I guess, like how much more the connection is, or at least mm-hmm. from my from my end. Like, mm-hmm. I'll be seeing that Sumi walk around and that little belly's there. And I'm like, I gotta go touch it. <laughs> I like, mm-hmm. walk over and I'm like, mm-hmm. touching it. And I'm like, talking, talking to her mm-hmm. and stuff. And it's like, I have no idea what's going on here. But mm-hmm. I just feel Dude. like such more of a strong connection to the the entity growing inside her, for one. Mm-hmm. And then my wife as a whole. Like, Oh, you will, I'm, dude. And I'm, I feel like I was already a very, like, like protective, like mm-hmm. sheepdog type person, all that type of stuff. And I've noticed that. I'm way more attentive to the people around Natsumi. I'm mm-hmm. way more attentive to like where she is, what she's doing, like all mm-hmm. those type of stuff. Just yeah. Because she's she got this little thing inside her and I got to protect it. Like, <laughs> Yeah. This, no, for real, man. Those, the, those are your like caveman instincts kicking yeah. in. You know what I mean? Yep. Like for sure. Um, but yeah, dude, you're going to see each other in a lot of different ways, bro. And the other thing I'll say this too, right? This isn't just like advice for your children and you, this is like advice for like between the pair of you, Mm -hmm. you are not going to see eye to eye on every parenting situation or every decision you make. Yeah. Um, And one thing I'll say too, is that's okay. And try to get to a point quick and upfront where you acknowledge that you both care and want to solve the problem or come up with an answer and just try to be patient. You know what I mean? And the other thing too, I'm just going to be real with you, man. Like this is your first kid. Not everything is an emergency, although it may seem like it, you know what I mean? And that might be like a 
mean, for me, that's like something that like my wife definitely, you know, was more <laughs> about, you know what I mean? Than me. Um, but uh, it just kind of remember that that is just like first kid feelings, I guess. Yeah. The second kid, you'd be like, fuck it. Add a little bit of dust on it. It's all right. You know? What's funny is that's kind of how Natsumi is. Natsumi will get like a little cut or something and it's like mm-hmm. the end of the world. And I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Bro, yeah. I'll tell you this, man. The One of the most like shitty things that first like first happened to me as a parent was um, my daughter fell um, and she smacked her, her lip on the end of the table, coffee table. And she actually bit through her lip mm. and we had to take her to the doctor to get stitches. and they gave her some local anesthetic and um, wrapped her in a blanket to where she was completely, totally immobile. And I had to hold her while she got stitches. That sucked. Right. And dude, she took it like a fucking champ. Um, doesn't remember it, obviously, because she mm-hmm. was like maybe like, I don't know, 18 months or something like that, maybe a little yeah. younger. And uh, but dude, as a parent, man, like. I felt terrible. You do like, like it's your fault yeah, that she like, hurt well, herself. Well, yeah, and I'm like, yeah. I'm holding her while this adult, this other adult, is causing her pain, even though mm-hmm. you know the doctor's literally just stitching up a hole in her you lip. Know, it's good you know pain what I mean? and all. It is stuff, right, yeah. you know. And so it's just like, yeah, I don't know, man. Being a parent is fucking wild, dude. And there'll be, <laughs> trust me, man. There'll be times when you'll say to your dad, "Be like, I get it." You know what I mean? <laughs> I get it. <laughs> trust me. Awesome. Well, cool, man. I think, I think this the concludes end of the episode, podcast. bro. Yeah. It was, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. If you find value in what we do, please don't forget to head over to Instagram or Facebook. Give us a follow. Um, share the content if you like it. Subscribe to us. You can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts. Um, share us with a friend, please. Mm-hmm. We appreciate it, and we appreciate all you guys listening. And uh, until next time, we have, um, we'll have have the Cognitive Marine. We'll talk about the comparisons between the United States and the Roman Empire. And we also got Luke Reagan coming up, finally getting around to our ancient civilizations topic. So appreciate Only you guys. Forever. Only took forever. If your forever. name's Jesse Carey, we're looking for you. We're looking for Jesse Carey. Please, somebody find Jesse Carey. Yes. And if you don't know, ask. Yes. Hashtag, where's Jesse Carey? Yes. Hey, Zach. Yes. Where's Jesse Carey? What's going on, Fire fans? I Came With Fire podcast is sponsored by Red Clover Coffee and Sheep's Clothing, LLC. Red Clover Coffee is a veteran-owned company with small batch roasted coffees, and they just happen to donate to some pretty awesome charities. Whether you're into specialty flavored coffees, single source coffees, or having a really cool coffee mug and some badass slaps, Red Clover has you covered. You can order ground, whole bean, or even coffee pods and get it all at 10% off your entire purchase using coupon code CAMEWITHFIRE. Again, that's 10% off your entire purchase using our coupon code CAMEWITHFIRE. I personally love their Blueberry Invasion and African Roast. That Blueberry Invasion hits the spot. Head over and get yourself some awesome coffee and support us by supporting our sponsor. I Came With Fire podcast is also sponsored by Sheep's Clothing, LLC. Sheep's Clothing, LLC is a unifying banner for all violent arts, disciplines, professions, and survivors of violent circumstances. Redefine violence. Both Zach and I being survivors of violent circumstances and LEOs in the military, we are especially excited to be able to offer you 10% off your entire purchase with coupon code FIRE10 at checkout. Whether you're looking for an awesome t-shirt, hats, slaps, flags, or MMA gear, they've got you covered. Me personally, I love my snapback with the leather patch surrounded by God's flannel. If you know, you know. That's coupon code FIRE10. F I R E one zero at checkout for 10% off your entire purchase. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. And if you should feel compelled, treat yourself by supporting our sponsors as well. They truly make a difference for us. Now let's make a difference for them. See you on the next show.